Guys, welcome back. I'm so excited because today I got somebody very special on the podcast. He is a former pit trader in Chicago. Um, he's also the creator of the Thinkorswim platform uh, in 1999. He sold it to TD Ameritrade for $606 million. In 2009, he's also the creator of Tasty Trade Online Financial Network, which came out in 2013. He's a creator of the Tasty Works platform in 2017, which he sold to IG Group this year for $1.1 billion. And also, sold uh, the small exchange platform for $250 million, I believe in the last week. So excited to have him on. This guy is one of my mentors. He's the worst. He's the world's foremost expert on retail options trading. Uh, he's the guy who taught me how to trade. Please welcome Sas Grande himself, Tom Sosnoff. Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Michael. It's it's been a fun ride. It has been a fun ride. So I want to go back to the beginning because I want to before. I mean, obviously, I talked about your accomplishments. You've sold several companies, but let's go back to the or origin of this because I'm always fascinated. With this Tom, if I was born 20 years older, I think I would have been a pit trader because I hear the stories that you and and Bat tell me. And uh, so, for instance, Bat said one time he got thrown through a wall by a professional wrestler at a at a, a while he was a pit trader. Did something like this happen? Yes, but at that point, he got thrown through the wall by um, by a guy that later became a professional, tried to become a professional wrestler because yeah. he didn't actually make it in the trading pits. But he was a guy that that uh, worked for me on and off. At the time, he threw the bat through the wall. He didn't work for us, so I didn't I didn't actually pay him to throw a bat through the wall. But he was um, he was the strongest human being in in Chicago. I don't know if he really was, but we felt he was. He was a he was an absolute monster, and um, he did pick the bat up with one hand and throw him through the wall. That's incredible. And the bat the bat is a big guy. Yeah, he's not yeah. a little guy. Yeah, that's incredible. Okay, so I heard other stories. Uh, Liz and Jenny said about fights out by the horse, or there was some kind of statue out in front of the. Uh, what, what, so you were at the CBOE, or the uh, wh where were you exactly? Well, the CB I was at the CBOE, but the CBOE and the Board of Trade were next door to each other. Okay, so it wasn't like they 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 were basically touching each other. There was a little walkway between the two. And we're talking about when, when, just for for my audience, we're talking about when you watch in movies like Wall Street, the guys holding up the cards, the pit traders, like you see at the New York Stock Exchange. But this is in Chicago. This is most mostly futures and commodity and commodities and stuff like that. Can you describe this? It's lots of yelling. You guys hired an offensive lineman one time to play uh, to 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 be in the pits. <laughs> we hired a lot of crazy people. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is the scene more like, um, if do you remember trading places? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I mean, in trading places, they kind of, you know, they, they may have exaggerated a little bit, but it was kind of like that. Um, it, and really was just like that. Uh, the first time I ever walked on the trading floor, I was like, holy, holy shit, man. I, this is, I was only 20, 23, 24, maybe. And I was like, this is where I got to be. Like I knew at the first second, I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I knew that's where I wanted to be. And um, that was the floor of the SIBO. That's just where I kind of ended up, you know, like a lot, most of us didn't have any money. We just ended up there and, you know, took a shot with whatever we had, hoped somebody would give us some money and, you know, blah, blah, blah. The rest is history type thing. Is it as wild as I've heard, like drinking and fights and crazy stuff like that going on or lots of yelling? You know, you don't realize it because you were, you don't realize it at the time because you're just a kid and like, you think that's life. Because all it is is a bunch of crazy freaking alpha males. Like everybody's the same. They're loud. They're obnoxious. They're annoying. They're like you know. It's like it's the most. It's the most extroverted people in the world <laughs> that have no. <laughs> that have. I mean, they're not afraid of anything. And you throw them all in a room together, and it's just like, oh my god, you're looking at a, a bunch of mirrors of yourself. And um, I think, you know. I think you would have loved it. I don't know. You're 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 a little bit. Um, I was an you, offensive you, lineman. I think I would have loved. I think I would have. And I'm allowed. I think when I listen to you guys, it's very out because when I listen to Liz and Jenny, and I can see it also in them. They're very tall, very robust young women who I feel like you, if you get in their personal space, they're going to fight back, right? Like I think it was Jenny who told me she almost got in a fight there one time uh, when she was a, a pit trader. So I mean, I, I think it would have been a great time. Well, the women that survived, yeah were brutally tough. There was a woman and stood in front of me for a number of years. And I mean, all the guys, no guy was scared of any other guy. Cause it was just life in the pits, but everybody was scared of her. Yeah. Like, she was like, these are the five words you can't say around me. And if I hear from you, I'm going to take you out. And I was like, and there was no doubt in my mind that she was serious. You know, like, and you know, we were friends obviously, but it was still, yeah, she was tough. They were all tough. Any woman that survived down there was tough as, I mean, incredibly tough. 
That's awesome. And so just, just so we're clear, because we're going to get to this in a little bit, uh, yeah. you created the Thinkorswim platform in 99 because you saw something coming. You saw a change coming with electronic trading, and then by, and you said hey, there was a very quick transition, and then the pits dried up. Well, I got to the trading pits like in 1981. And um, so I was there for, you know, 18 years of my life standing in about a one foot spot. You know, like, like if, did you see Wolf of Wall Street? I did. So that's a pretty good, like that type of insanity. Not, not, that wasn't a pit trading movie, but that type of insanity in the 80s, like was what we, you know, I mean, in the 80s, we were making way more money than professional athletes. So we're just a bunch of stupid kids and like, you know, stupid kids with way too much money with crazy friends. You know, the whole thing was just, it was, it was almost surreal and, and, you know, shit happens type thing. You know, it's, it's just, it's weird, but it all kind of happened that way. You know, so, I, I didn't, I didn't think about, it. I didn't know any better. When I have bat on here, we're going to talk about the excessive drug use and the fighting. I guess that's what we'll do. Um, that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, the excessive drug use was, 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 I mean, these were, you know, there was no drug testing back then. Of so, course. And there was no marijuana. You know what I mean? Like the excessive <laughs> drug use was, was much worse than, you know, um, it was a whole different level of drugs. Uh, so yeah, that's amazing. All right. So now we, we cr what is the ethos behind you creating think or swim? So for those of you who are currently with TD Ameritrade now, which I hope you switch over to Tastyworks, but if you are with, you are on the think, think or swim platform, Tom is one of the creators of the think or swim platform. What was the idea behind creating think or swim? Well, I was standing in the pit one day and Scott Sheridan was my, you know, part, we had like a bunch of different trading partners and stuff like that. And and I tell you, I was there for 18 years, never really moved. I mean, I literally didn't move my spot for 18 years. And, and I turned to Scott and I go, you know, this shit's going away. At some point, this is, this pit's going to become a swimming pool like bowling alley, whatever it is. But, you know, we're going to be replaced by something, not a robot, but by some form of electronic trading. And I go, we got to, you know, we had made, we, we had done really well in the trading world you know, you can make a lot of money, like a million, $2 million a year as a kid, easy. And like, you know, every single year, but you blow it all. Like yeah. you spend it. Like if you make a million dollars a year as, as a 25 year old, you spend 2 million, you know, like, like I mean, there's you, no amount of money you can, if you, we used to say, if you make a million and you lose a million, you're down a million. Like you don't have, you're not, you're not even, you're down a million. So, so, you know, we, we, we made a lot of money. We spent a lot of money and we saved a reasonable amount of money and we decided to take a shot and build something. And we had invested previously, um, but Michael, it was all like typical, like, you know, tax shelters that we lost money on, restaurants that we lost money on, other traders that we lost money on, right. like everything was a loser. And then we said, you know, screw us, we're gonna do this ourselves. So Scott and I sat down, we took all the money that we made, we didn't tell our families at all. And we pulled it together and we decided that Scott would stay on the floor for a couple of months and try to, you know, make some money for the two of us and to, just for living. And I'd go out and build thinkorswim and, and that's what we did. And it worked. And you, you guys, uh, got some Russian programmers for the original thinkorswim. Is that correct? Well, if you remember 1999 yeah, and you're a little young, so you were still in high school probably. No, I was, uh, um, I was in college. I was a senior in college. I'm so 20 years, I'm 20 years younger than you. Yeah. So 1999 was a shit show as I far know. as, um, the, the, it was the dot com explosion. Yeah. There were no yeah. develop. There was literally no developers in America. I mean, none. And we couldn't, um, and we didn't have any experience and we didn't know like even where to look. We were traders. We weren't software developers. So we connected with a group out of New York City that had, that was fronting for a group in Russia. You know, we took a shot and we met these kids that had just got out of technical institute, like the MIT of St. Petersburg. And we hit it off with them. Like we really liked them. We fired the group in New York. We just said, you know, screw you guys. We don't need you. We'd made a deal with these guys, four kids, literally four kids in an unheated garage in St. Petersburg. Like just, it's a, it's a Steve Jobs story. I swear. Yeah. They're in an unheated garage in St. Petersburg. It's the middle of the winter. It's freaking cold. We fly into Chicago. We all hit it off. We decide we're going to build this thing. And w they lied to us in the sense we said, have you ever built anything like this before? They go, sure, we do it all the time, but they never <laughs> did. <laughs> they didn't even know what an option was, but they yeah. were so damn smart that today they are, that same company still exists. 
They are 850 developers globally, and they are the leading fintech dev firm. This is 20 years later, 22 years later. They're the leading fintech dev firm in the world with 850 developers in like nine countries. And we started with four guys in a garage. I tried to buy them in 2005, 2006, and the Russian crazy laws, you know, Russian right. business laws. We spent three days and all that got paid was the lawyers got, you know, got some money out of it. But um, brilliant group. We still use them today. They're still one of our core development firms. So Tastyworks um, was developed by the same group of guys. No, Tastyworks was developed internally in Chicago. Okay. But we use them for other projects, like they built the small exchange. We have other other businesses, other projects that we still use them for. I mean, they still build, you know, TD Ameritrade. They build, you know, I mean, they build the Toss platform. They build lots of platforms around the world. They're amazing. But um, regardless, it, it was it's a crazy story. We at the time we were building on in a Java platform on Sun Microsystems hardware. And there was no Sun Microsystems available in Russia because it was just, you know, after the Cold War, you right. couldn't buy anything. So we actually smuggled a, um, a, a couple of servers from Chicago in their suitcases with their dirty laundry. But they were only like 20. You know, they, I'm sorry. They were 18, 19, 20, 21. I mean, these were super geniuses. These were kids that not only did they never did anything wrong, they didn't even drink. They don't right. do anything, you know, and we were smuggling Sun Micro servers <laughs> Um, back into into Russia so that they could build a test environment and that nobody ever looked at their stuff, of course, because um, they were just kids. And, you know, they didn't scan the suitcases back then. So we built a whole infrastructure in St. Petersburg at the time so we could test the stuff we were building. And then we you know, obviously built it up in Chicago and then the rest is kind of history. And then we, you know, and, and to this day, they're still building that platform and it's the biggest trading platform in the world, you know, the Thinkorswim platform is it's run by Schwab, TD, the whole yeah. deal. It's yeah. the, you know, same, same guy still. Okay. So we're going to go back into that, but I need to skip over. Cause we skipped over something that I forgot to ask you about. You yeah. had uh courtside tickets to the Chicago bulls back in those days. And Michael Jordan used to come over and play poker at your house. Well, that's a whole nother world. But I'll tell you the yeah. story. Cause it's really pretty. It's yeah. one of my favorite. Yeah. It's one of my favorite parts of times of my life. Yeah. So, so we're upstairs trading. This is before, this is in 1980, like 1983 or something, 1984, something like that, yeah. whatever, 1985. I don't remember when it was. Michael was a rookie and uh, 1984. And so, you know, the Bulls, I, this is before your time, but the Bulls were so bad in the old Chicago stadium. They couldn't sell, they couldn't sell 3,000 seats to yeah. a game. At night. I mean, they, they couldn't sell anything. You could sit three rows behind the court if you wanted to any night. For, the Bulls were horrible. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, through the grace of God, somehow the first time God ever looked down in Chicago and threw us a bone, you know, the, the, the trailblazers took Sam Bowie, then Elijah one went to the Rockets yeah. and next thing, you know, Michael Jordan drops to the bulls, the bulls front office didn't know what to do. Cause they just drafted this amazing kid. So they sent their marketing team to the board of trade where our offices were. And for some unknown reason, they picked our floor and they just started knocking on doors, trying to sell courtside seats. At the time they were 50, they were 50 or $75. I think $70, were $75 a game for courtside, for, for but courtside they couldn't sell. to see Jordan as a rookie. Yeah, but they couldn't sell one ticket. That's okay. Incredible. So they got to our office and they hadn't sold a single ticket yet. And they got to our office and you know, they were selling season packages. And my buddy Jules is sitting there and he goes, he goes, he goes, All right, let's 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 take a year. Who cares? You know, we'll take four seats and we'll take center court right at the because they had them, any seat you want. So we go, all right, we'll take four seats. And and we reached each of us, each four of us were doing the $75 times, whatever it was, uh, you know, uh, 41 games. It was, you know, the whole thing was like $3,200 or something like that. It was nothing. And so we give them a check on the spot. And then as we're handing them the money, Jules goes, you know what? We're idiots. Why do we want to sit at center court? This team stinks. Let's take the <laughs> four seats at the end of the bench because Jordan sits at the end of the bench. He doesn't yeah. sit with the rest of the team. Yeah. So we go, I go end of the bench, but you can't even see the game. There. He goes, no, we don't see the game. We'll just get the bullshit with him. So we sit at the end. of the, So we take the four seats at the end of the bench. It was a very, it's the best call this kid ever made. And he's still, he's still one of my best friends. Say he still works with us the whole deal. Yeah. So we take the four seats at the end of the bench. So Jordan's like, is, 
you know, as soon as he gets on the court, his rookie year, you know, the, the kid's unbelievable. Yeah. And we look at each other, we're like, holy cow, this kid, you know, he's way better than we thought he was. Yeah. And, and now he's blowing everything up, you know, and at night he's got no friends. He's in Chicago. He's what, 22, 23. He's got no friends. He's not like a really likable guy. Like other than the fact that he's, he's about to be like the greatest athlete in the world. He wasn't really like a real friendly guy. Like, yeah. you know, like, like the cops that sat at the end of the thing were his closest friends. Like he didn't have any friends on the team. Nobody talked to him. So at night, you know, every night we'd be at the game and finally he just started leaning over going, you know, like he found out we were traders and he kept going to us. Well, how many points do you think I'm going to get tonight? And we'd make a market on him every night for like 20 bucks. <laughs> and he'd go and whatever market he made, he would take the over. Like if we said, Will's 2832, he'd go 32, up 32 bid for $500, you know, That's and crazy. we'd sell it to him. We were like giving him money, but we, we still made a fair market. You know, when he started averaging 35 a night, we'd make the market like 33, 38. He never lost. Yeah, Whatever second, number we put out there, he went over. His second year, I think he averaged 37 points. They put him at point guard. He's averaged 37 points a game. Whatever number yeah. we did, we went above it every single game and he still beat us every single game. Anyway, so so we kind of become friends. And one night he leans over and he says, what are you guys doing after the game? And now we're all married. You know, no, at that time we weren't married. Yeah, I think we were. And yeah, we were. And like, but, you know, like we don't go out on a Thursday night at 11 o'clock, you know, <laughs> like it's not, it's not something we do or 1030. And he goes, well, I got a hit on, you know, CBS tonight after, you know, after the game. And then I feel like playing some poker and we're like, all right, let's do it. You know, like we'll play at midnight on a Thursday night. And that started what turned into being a, a 15 year, like 15 years of playing poker with him on a, on game nights, you know, after the game at midnight till four or five in the morning. And uh, he was a, he was a, you know, he loved to gamble. He was a degenerate. The first night we cleaned him out of all his money and he was so mad that because we offered him a marker, we said, listen, you're good for it. We'll, we'll lend you whatever. And he said, you know, F you guys, I'm going out. He got more money somehow and came back. He lost that too. He lost like maybe five or seven grand to us to a group of us. And we were laughing and teasing him. And he was like, determined, I'm going to kill you, you know, you guys for the rest of my life. If I, if it's what it takes. And we played for 15 years. And at the end of 15 years, he made a lot of money off us. That's crazy. Okay. Now you also played what three on one against him one time in basketball. Was this something four on two. It was four on two. What happened there? It was, uh, we were in Vegas for the weekend. Okay. We killed, it was the first time we ever killed in Vegas. Like we went home, we were, it was a bachelor party. We, we got hot at the, um, uh, back rack table and we made a, crap load of money in Vegas. We got home on a Sunday night and the, um, the bulls were playing. Um, I can't remember. They were playing the 76ers and it was a playoff game. And are you still, you're still with yeah, me, right? I'm with you. Yeah, okay. yeah. Keep going. I didn't see your face. Yeah. So, so it was a playoff game against the 76ers and Jordan and Barkley were friends then. Yeah. And Jordan leans over and he goes, Hey, what do you think about a poke game? Then I'll try to bring Barkley. And we go, done. And we were flush with cash. Like, cause we just made, we go and we're ready, Michael. We've been in Vegas all weekend. We're ready to go. And so he goes, all right, we'll do it at your house, my house. Well, I happen to house, have a house with an, at the time I lived in this old loft, which had an indoor basketball court. He didn't know idea because yeah. he had been to another house of mine, whatever, but this, is this, this in Chicago or, or Vegas? The, the house, no, Chicago, the Chicago, you Chicago. had a house with an indoor basketball court. Yeah. This would have been, I think they played the Sixers in like 88. I think, I can't, I can't remember what something year. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. It's something like that. It's probably 88, 89, yeah. something like that. Maybe nine. No, it, it may have been, no, this was during their run or something. This was in yeah. like the, I don't remember. Maybe, maybe around that. Yeah. So, so, and, and they won and he scored like, you know, 40 points. Barkley was pissed. He didn't come. Michael showed up at midnight at, and we've been drinking. He's smoking cigars and drinking. He drank like light beers or whatever. And then about four in the morning and he's in slippers. He goes, he got, cause, cause one guy goes, let's go play basketball. Mike goes, you got a basketball court here. I go, yeah, downstairs. I got an indoor court. He goes, he goes, he goes, well, I'm not playing basketball with you freaking losers. You know, I just got done playing a playoff game in the NBA. I'm not playing with four Jewish white kids <laughs> from, uh, you know, and so we go, what's it going to take? So he gave us a number 
And, um, and we said, and we said, ah, screw it. You know, you only live once, right? You get to play with Michael. So, but it's four on two. He had, a, he had his bodyguard there yeah. who was like, he played, he played at North Carolina, but he played, but he was like, he wasn't, he was like the end of the bench guy, you okay. know, like, like a walk on, but he could play because he made the team at North Carolina. So it was him and his buddy against the four of us. And we played a lot of ball. I know it doesn't look like it, but we did play on ball. So we're laughing because we're thinking four on two. How's he ever going to win this game? Yeah. Okay. And and we actually believed we were going to win. And I don't think there was a shadow of a doubt in his mind that he was going <laughs> to wipe the floor with us. Okay. Anyway, he ended up winning. That's and, incredible. Uh, we lost. He won. We talked about it for the next 10 years. Um yeah, you know, we we ended up playing some golf over the years and and a bunch of and then we just, you know, kind of went our separate ways when he left Chicago. That's incredible, man. That what what a what a crazy story, man. That it was, was a like, good run. We were at all the play, we were at every game for, you know, all those years. Yeah, and, I've seen the video of you at the NBA Finals. You were at the NBA Finals. Yeah, we were at them all. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. So you were at all six championships. Well, they only, I think, the only three of them they won in Chicago, and oh, three they won on the but road. Were at, we were at all, all oh, six championships. That's incredible, man. What, what? Well, I got, a, I got one more story to yeah. add. It's just really good. So, one game, we're sitting there one night, and this guy walks up. It's the middle of the Bulls run, like they've won like three championships, and this guy walks up to us and he goes, you know, now I had kids and the whole deal, and he goes, hey. I want to buy your seats off you. We're like, get out of here. You know, like we're not selling our seats. He's like, now the seats are like a thousand dollars a game. You know, they started off at 75 bucks. Now they're like a thousand dollars a game or 1500 or whatever they are. They're a crazy number. He goes, I want to buy your seats off you. So we go, get out of here. We're not selling our seats. He goes, no, I'm, I'll make it worth your while. He goes, how's this for a deal? I'll give you 50 grand tonight cash and I'll pay for your tickets forever and you get half the games half the playoffs and i'll give you 50 grand cash and i'll cover the cost of tickets forever we're like and we think he's bullshitting so we say make it a hundred and we'll do it the guy whips out his checkbook writes a check for a hundred grand as we're sitting there and we didn't even like the trade we were just like we just didn't think he was going to do it writes a check for a hundred grand and then hands it to us and he goes and he goes, as soon as this clears, I want half the tickets and I'll give you a check for the cost. <laughs> Done. That relationship lasted for like the next seven or eight years. Wow. It was wow. insane. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Crazy uh, stories. Uh, all right. So so let's go back because uh, we, we talk about Michael Jordan here. You've just created the Thinkorswim platform and you've done some things that are very different, right? There's a lot of disruption. For those, for those people who are familiar with trading, mid-price came from that platform. Is that correct? You guys were the yeah. first one to come up with mid-price. So just, just, just to reiterate, before you said you guys were making a lot of money on the pit in the pits, and the reason why was because the bid ask spread was sort of determined on the pits, and there was like a, a big wide spread between the two, and that's where you made your money. Is that correct? Yeah, this is in the early, you know, mid, early eighties, mid eighties, yeah. early nineties. By the end, by the end, by by nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, the markets had tightened up dramatically. Yeah. So it was a very. As soon as we went to decimalization, everything changed. Okay, and then now you 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 know for those of you who do trade, you guys will see a, a bid and an ask, and then in the middle it'll say mid. And you guys were the first one to put in a mid price. And what where did that mid price come from? Um, it just came from the software we were building because yeah. there was no other platform at the time that did option spreads. Mm -hmm. So when we built the toss platform, it was the first one that had option spreads. So we didn't want the customer to default to the offer price or the bid price because the markets were too wide. Yeah. So we had them default to the mid price and then we worked it off the mid price. And they were there were other companies that were pissed that you did this. There were other companies that were pissed about everything we did, but we didn't care. Yeah. And you guys I mean, we used to get calls, we were fielding calls from compliance. I remember one time, you know, we picked up the phone and it was like the Fidelity legal team saying, you know, everything you guys are doing illegal, we're going to turn you into the, you know, the regulators. And we're like, um, yeah, send us a cake and go to hell. You know, like, you know, you know <laughs> it was like, you know, we, we didn't, everything we were doing was totally just disrupting and changing the industry. We didn't, we didn't, we were just making it a lot more fair for individual investors. Definitely. And then also weekly options came from you guys. And that also came from the toss platform. You were the yep. first ones at the before it was just op option expirations were just the third Thursday of every month. And then you guys yep. went on to uh, you guys went on to do weekly. And then also implied volatility was something 
uh, or applied volatility rank. Was that something you guys came up with? Or, yes. Yeah. And that yeah. was Tom Preston from Austin. He was the one who came yeah. up with this? He, he yeah. developed that? Yeah. yeah, he was. Well, he was our models guy. So at the time, we really only had one like, like, um, like models geek. And there was no data scientist back then. So Tom had been writing um, software uh, for for a company that was owned by SunGuard, like in professional trading software, and he was writing the models for them. So we hired him and he wrote all the option models and the analysis stuff on, you know, on Thinkorswim. He's still with us today. He's at Tasty now. So can you describe implied volatility for the, the stripper who just got off at the Rhino at 6 a.m. who's watching this? Um, what, what is, what is expect, implied volatility? It, it's expected move. Expected move, right. So Yeah, that, what, that's all it is. Yeah, we, we you can tell within a range uh, within one standard deviation of like where the middle 68.27%, that's what implied volatility will measure for yeah. based yep. on volatility. Okay. We'll get in, yeah. we'll get, we'll get into black shoals later. You can do the math for us later for that. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, so there's that. And then you sell in 09. So 10 years of having think or swim. And then, uh, and bat, bat and I were having a drink one time and he told me the story about the crash of 08 and then things that led up into the sale of at the time, your ticker symbol was at SWIM, and you guys sell to TD Ameritrade for $606 million. How does that whole transaction go down? We actually sold for $750. $750. They just, they, yeah, it's, the sale price was $750, and they, um, we were a public company. So the whole thing went down. Um, we were in a tough position because we had three companies bidding for us, all in cash at the same time. And so our board, Scott and I lost control of the board. Um, what that means is we were the largest shareholders, but we didn't control the board anymore. So um, we decided that we actually voted against the buyout, um, but we decided we would vote against it, but we wouldn't be difficult. So we voted against it, but like I said, we weren't, we didn't, we decided not to be difficult. So we went along with it because, you know, who knows, stuff happens. And um, uh, they bought a TD. TD had the, it was the most attractive deal for us because everybody else wanted to kind of pay cash and they were willing to do it with stock and the market was oversold, we felt. So we wanted stock. So here's another good story. So at the time when TD bought us um, for 750 million, they, part of it was cash and part of it was stock. We actually wanted stock, not cash. Most deals, the, the people being bought out want cash. Right. But at the time, we felt their stock was too cheap. This is the crash. So, of, this after the crash of 08. And then the, we, don't, right. we don't rebound is, until March of 09. So I that's see, right. Yeah. So we had just rebounded, but it was the, their stock was still dirt cheap. And so we felt that it was a better play to take their stock. The deal was much more creative to them if they gave us cash. But we wanted stock. So we, we said, listen, we'll take a third in cash, but we want two thirds in stock. They go, well, we have enough cash to do the whole thing in cash but we don't have enough cash. We don't have enough stock to do two thirds in stock. Yeah. So, so they made a deal with the Ricketts who were the founders of TD Ameritrade who wanted to buy the Cubs. So this is a little known story. The Ricketts needed $350 million in cash. Uh, they didn't have enough cash to buy the Cubs with. The Cubs were like 800, $850 million. So the Ricketts, so TD Ameritrade, um, bought stock back from the Ricketts for 350 million. The Ricketts got 350 million in cash. TD gave the stock that they bought to us. And it was a three-way transaction. Wow. Wow. So the crazy. Cubs, it's like a three-way, it's like a three-way trade in the NBA. It's a three-way trade. Yeah. TD, TD gave, TD gave the Ricketts cash. The Ricketts gave TD stock. TD gave the stock to us. Uh, wow. Cause they didn't have enough inventory. That's um, unbelievable. Okay. So, and now, so that was how the three-day trade, and it's a good trade for the Ricketts because now the Cubs are probably worth, you know, yeah. Four or five billion, so it was a good trade for them too. So now I I, I never understood this part. Now you are the owner of this publicly traded company. They have given you a certain amount of stock, so that makes you a board member. How do you end up becoming an executive over at TD Ameritrade? How does that work? Well, I mean that's that's their call, you know. Like they, so know, they just hired you because they bought your company. Now they hired you to run the well. The, most the, people, the platform. most most times when your company gets bought, you know, there's there's two ways to look at it when you get bought out in sports they would fire everybody yeah. because that's just the nature of like sports. If they, if a new owner comes in, they get to bring in a new head coach, a new manager, whatever it is, they want their own people in there. In the world of finance, TD wanted me and Scott and who, everybody else. And I don't blame them because, you know, we had a good, a really strong reputation. And, and so we sat down, they made us an offer. We, we accepted it. We liked, we liked the CEO. 
But he was a good guy. As far as retail options trading, though, like today in 2021, you guys are light years ahead of everyone else. And I can imagine in 2009, you guys are just hundreds of thousands of light years ahead of everyone else. As far as TD uh, Thinkorswim compared to everyone else, which is why TD Ameritrade bought you. So they probably need your needed your expertise in order to to run the platform. It was a great deal for TD Ameritrade. Yeah, a great yeah. deal, and it was actually even a still a great deal for Schwab when they bought TD Ameritrade. I mean, the whole reason they bought it was for the Thinkorswim platform. Yeah. So the answer is, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't want to sell. We thought it was too cheap and blah, blah, blah. But you know what? Things happen for a reason. And, and um, you know, this gave us an opportunity. I had a really good relationship with the CEO of TD Ameritrade. They were the first investor in Tasty Trade. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so like when I said, can I, you know, I asked to leave a year early before my contract was up because I was like, I have an idea. I want to go build something. But, um, you know, we had a good relationship. So I said, I'd love you to be my partner. And he goes, done, let's do it. So now you, 09, you sell, and then you're an executive there. You get out one year early and you create the Tasty Trade online financial network, which I believe at this point is still the largest online financial network in the world. And you digital, got yeah. the online digital financial network in the world. Yeah. And you guys specialize in selling premium, selling stock options. Can you talk about the ethos behind that? Originally, you guys were just going to hire comedians. Like there was a very different type of show than what it ended up becoming now. Yeah. So Tasty was an idea that I had for a long time, which was I hated traditional financial media like CNBC, Bloomberg, you know, all the typical news guests, all that crap that just the, the nonstop bullshit. And um, to me, it, it, it was it was just mindless chatter that didn't actually help people make money. So we had an idea that we'll build a financial network that is that's built around comedians, but that it's really, you know, it's like a combination of you know, all the show, all the radio shows that I liked, like, you know, maybe Stern back yeah. in the day or something else like that, you know, with comedians, with, with a lot of stupid stuff. And at the same time with a lot of quantitative, you know, research and analysis and just a whole different approach, math-based approach to finance. And it grew from that. And, you know, we rented a hip hop studio, we raised some capital and, and we had some fun we built an amazing company over the last 10 years. And the thing that makes Tasty Trade so interesting, the thing that sold me was the market measure pieces where you guys back test yeah. different things that you found before. So, for instance, you would go back to 2005 and say, hey, this sure. is a strategy we're going to tell you about today. And this is how this strategy would have worked over the last 15 years. In fact, we're still doing it today. You, we're doing it even in so much more depth and, yeah. and with, you know, with smarter people and more depth. It's incredible. And yeah. you've actually for the Tasty Works platform, you created a look back uh app, which will actually allow me to do my own market measures. Now I can go back and look at my own trades, how yeah. they would have done over a certain period of time. Yeah, sure. Is that correct? Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So during the time you tasty trade, that's when I discover you guys. I, I come on the show. I've probably been on the show like seven or eight times at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I come on, do a bunch of interviews with you guys. And it makes sense to me because the quantitative trading and because I used to be a U.S. military officer, it was like it, it is actually very similar to navigating an airplane to, to, to trading stock options. It's very much confirm and send, make a decision, quick math type of type of thinking. Yes. You come up for the idea for Tasty Works. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Bat, don't get mad at me. Bat told me before anyone was supposed to know that you guys were going to do this. He, he had already told me you guys had an idea for a brokerage. Hey, that hey, was hey, come. hey, hey, uh, tell Bat, tell the world. Yeah, tell Bat, tell the world. <laughs> so I, I know you, because you guys didn't want TD Ameritrade to know at the time, what was the the idea? Because you guys were going to have to leave TD Ameritrade if you created your own brokerage. So what happens at the time uh, you come up with the idea for Tastyworks? So we spent five years you know, with a marketing deal with those guys, of which was very profitable for us and very profitable for them. And after five years, our deal ran up. And those guys had, they were going through some changes at the top. The CEO was leaving. The new CEO was coming in. We didn't really know the new CEO. Is this McKinnahan? Is he, is this, is this part? No, there's, I don't know who McKinnahan is. This, it was Fred Tomzak originally was the CEO. And then it switched over to a guy named Tim Hockey. What, what, Fred, the guy, we the guy with the banana. The, you remember the banana joke? Yeah, that's he, Joe Kinahan. That's Joe Kinahan, Joe Kinahan, Joe Kinahan. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, we're still friends. He's yeah. still there. He runs TD now. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, we're, um, so after five years, Michael, we're, we're, we're doing great for those guys and our contracts up. So we sit down to renegotiate, you know, in another five years and they offer us almost 200 million for five year deal. And we looked at each other and we go, so these guys are offering us. There's something we're, here. It, we're a tiny little digital financial network. And we know we're really good at what we do, but 
we're a tiny little digital financial network and they're offering us almost $200 million for like a, you know, five or seven year deal. I don't remember exactly the length of time. And we must be way, we must be giving them way more customers than we ever thought we were. Yeah. And so, so we sat down, you know, Scott, myself, Christy and Woody, we, we, we were the same group that built Thinkorswim. We sat down and we said, all right, what do you want to do? Do you want to do the deal with these guys? Um, and we'll be locked in for another five or seven years and we'll just do our thing, which is fine. It's, we're profitable. It's great. You know, blah, blah, blah. Or do you want to just say, you know, kind of fuck it, let's do it ourselves again. And we all looked at each other. We go, let's do it ourselves. You know, yeah. we don't want to work for them. Let's just do it ourselves. So we went out and did ourselves again. That's it. So your you know your contract expires and now you come up. You already know you've built your own, your own brokerage. Now you want to build another brokerage. Uh, yeah. And this one, the the trading platform is it's it's you you took some of the things from Toss, but you made it a little bit more. I don't know how to explain it for for. No, we actually built it with um, the same the same CTO. Yeah. Um, because he stayed with us the whole time. Woody but, Ma, but a completely different team of developers, and we built it in house in Chicago. Woody Ma. Yeah, yeah, Woody's still here. Woody is the CTO. Okay, got it. Yeah, and so you guys, but we built it in house with our own group of developers right in Chicago, um, and it's completely different technology. We decided to build it on a high frequency middleware, so it's a it's the only high frequency platform in existence today for retail investors, and it's it's just a different type of technology. Simple, no bloat, tons of functionality, tons of you know, it it gets right to the point. Make the damn trade. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely can agree with that. And I was reading a review about Tastyworks uh, today, and they, the one of the cons, you know what it was? No financial media. It's like, it's like nobody. He's like, yes, that's right. Tom Sosnoff would never allow financial media on his platform. I thought that was that was well. Cool. You know, when I built Thinkorswim, I made the first deal ever with with CNBC yeah. to put it on the platform, and you know, like I don't, I don't regret doing that. But at the time, I never thought about doing it ourselves. Yeah. You know, now I would never do anything but doing it ourselves. You know, I mean, Dylan Radigan, um, who was the host of uh, one of the hosts on CNBC and was really was the guy that started Fast Money. I mean, he's been with Tasty now for about seven years as, you know, as a as a, you know, helping to add content and as a consultant with us. And he's been on the network, you know, and and I love Dylan, but it's so funny how how far he's come and everything else. It's just, you know. It's, yeah. He's drinking the Kool Aid too. Yeah, I mean, he was a skeptic when you guys first first started doing oh, yeah, the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Truth or skepticism, and now he's trying to get you to buy into teleportation. So yeah, uh, he's definitely come a long way. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dylan, Dylan Dylan's going to be on this program eventually. Also, so now here's the thing: for those of you who are watching this, and you're like, oh, you know what? What's crazy is in the last couple of years, I started getting no commissions on stock trades. You are looking at the gentleman who created that. The reason why you get no commissions on stock trades now is because Tastyworks did it first. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And you guys, and when you did that, what describe what happens? Because this is a huge well, disruption in the space. Fair. Let's let's be fair. We don't do a lot of stock business. Yeah. So we did it. It's it's kind of like a marketing thing. We don't, you know, we lose money every time somebody trades stocks. I mean, yeah. we don't. We we just simply don't make any money. Zero. But um, uh, but we did it because stock business is like one percent of our business. It's nothing. But right so, after you did it, there was a pretty disruptive move that happened in other firms as soon as you yes, went to zero yeah. zero commissions. Could you talk yeah. about that? What happened? Well, the rest of the industry decided, you know, they would they would lower their get rid of their like their what they call a ticket charge. Yeah. And um, so they got rid of that. They lowered all the fees and and you know, all of a sudden the whole industry became super competitive, you know, price wise, which which for the consumer, it's a great thing. You know, the difference is like a Robinhood went total free. Um, but, but they don't give you any software. It's, it's untradeable. So you yeah. can't, you know, use the platform. I mean, it's not, it's not a, it's not a strategy platform, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, it's a, it's an app. So I, y you can't really do anything on stuff like that. Okay. So now at this point you are, um, you, you've built this and then the small exchange was the idea because futures contracts are so big to create smaller versions of futures contracts, similar to how you, you don't have to trade whole Bitcoins. You can trade individual Satoshis. You guys were going to do, so for instance, if I was going to buy an S&P co contract right now, it's $4,770. You, you would be able to break those up. Can you describe the idea for the small exchange? Um, the idea was small, standard, and simple. Let's get all the confusion out of futures trading and let's make it, you know, let's make the contract small. Let's standardize everything. Let's make it simple for the users because individual investors have enough to worry about. Let's just give them a product that's highly leveraged that they would understand. 
And um, when we started to build it, you know, conceptually, then the CME copied everything we did, you know, like it's, you know, that's a, they did. It's the nature of the business, you know, like we knew that was going to happen. Everybody copies everything we do, but um, we got it out there. You know, we ran into a, plenty of hurdles. You know, we didn't, we don't have enough customers to, you know, really build a futures exchange around, but we did change the whole industry. We changed the fee structure. We changed the product structure. We changed the simplicity of products. Um, we, you know, we got, we got a really cool exchange going and, um, but we recognized recently that, you know, we need more customers, way more customers. So we made a deal with crypto.com. We sold our exchange licenses to, they need it. They need exchange licenses. We need more customers. So it was a match made in heaven. Um, we sold them the small exchange. We can focus on our core businesses now. So wait, the, the small exchange was trading crypto also along with futures? It was not. It was We had one crypto future, but they were equity based. Okay, got it. All right. And then we you couldn't get regulatory approval to trade the um, the cash assets. Yeah. So we were in the process of it, but we didn't get regulatory I, I, approval. I, I remember you guys talking about this for a while. Also yeah. the same thing with portfolio margin. That took a little longer than we expected. Yeah. But yeah, that, yeah. that finally came around. So now here's the thing. So now you sell that for a quarter million dollars, $250 million. You sell, uh, but before that you sell, that was in the last couple of weeks, right? You sold a small yeah, exchange. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before this, you sell uh, you sell Tastyworks, the IG Group, which is a British company for one point one billion. Can you go into how yes. how did that come around? So at this time, I'm I'm using Tastyworks. I've got several accounts. So uh, so how does in, how does this work? So back in two thousand end of two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I said there were three companies that were trying to buy Thinkorswim. Remember yeah. that part of the story? Yeah. Okay. Fast forward now. That was ten years after we started Thinkorswim. Fast forward 10 years after we start Tasty Trade. We started in 2011. Now it's 2021 or 2020, 2021. We hadn't had a single person in 10 years talk to us about our business. People avoid us like the like we are yeah, the, Tom, we are the bastard. We're the redheaded stepchild. We are we are definitely the group that nobody wants to have anything to do with. Nobody. Tom, can I can, so, can I interrupt you real quick? So for yeah. those of you who are watching this, because I, I I'm on the outside looking in, Tom, and I want to describe this to other people. Those of you like those of you who are into this whole thing where you're you're looking at meme stocks and you're on Robin Hood or whatever. Tom is the guy who created the disruptions that you're looking at now. But for, traditional financial media does not. They're so disruptive that traditional financial media tries to ignore Tom and Tasty Trade <laughs> and Scott and all this stuff. They they try as hard as they can. Every time there's an article about them, they try to say stuff that isn't real. They try to trash all the stuff. And when you go and, and actually see the network, you don't have to pay for anything. It's completely free. I currently now work as a portfolio manager at a small fund because of what Tom taught me and because of the stuff I learned at Tasty Trade. Tom got me the job. So that, that's the thing I'm trying to tell you. I am a normal retail trader learning from him. This is very dangerous and scary to a lot of traditional financial people for people to take, again, those uh, wealth management, you know, you, you, you put a bunch of money in Bank of America and there's a wealth management guy who, who reaches out to you and wants to help you with your growth fund or whatever. All that stuff is caca garbage. And Tom teaches you that. And so when that happens, that's incredibly dangerous for the business model of a lot of these traditional financial institutions and banks and stuff like that. So they try to act like Tom doesn't exist. They try to act like they try to act like this the Tasty Works whole thing doesn't exist. None of this ever happened. Look the other way. La 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 la. I'm just I'm just giving you guys from my yeah. standpoint because I live here in Las Vegas and I'm around a bunch of douchebag crypto people who who don't have any idea what a bid ask spread. They have no idea how liquidity works. Nothing. The idea of traditional finance, Black Shoals, standard deviation, any of this stuff is completely over their head because they completely skipped it. And they, they and, and when I talk to them about you guys and I'm like, hey, this is how I learned how to do this. They're just completely mind blown by it because like I said before traditional media and just tries to skip over tasty trade and, and, and the stuff that you did, but your company gets sold for $1.1 billion. So the actual value is really there. Anyway, go back to what you said before um, about this, uh, the point where IG Group is now reaching out to you to, to try to buy Tastyworks. So what I was saying is that it, it, in 10 years after we started Tasty, you know, at first nobody was looking at us, but then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's a lot of, we decided at some point that we're going to make a move to go to the next level, which means we either had to go public in the US, we could have done it via SPAC or direct listing. Um, we know how good the firm is. We make a lot of money. We have a huge revenue where our model is beautiful. Um, and, or we can do it with a global firm that already exists, you know? And so we started looking at firms and once the word got out that we were talking to a few people, you know, we had five offers for Tasty, five offers in like less than two months. Yeah. And we, 
And some of them were to go public and some of them were to do a deal. And we ended up choosing the firm that had the most um, complimentary products to us because we figured long-term value. So IG supports every non-listed product in the world, like 17,000 products in every country other than the US and all in the cash markets. We support all the cash markets in the US and all the listed products. And in my mind, their stock was trading way undervalued like a prop firm. And I liked that deal the best. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't love the SPAC prices. Like we could have got half a billion dollars more in the SPAC marketplace or right. a billion dollars more. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it. I like, I I think we this is the perfect deal for us. We because I don't like giving up control, but on the other side, I've reached a certain point in my life where I recognize that, you know, we got to get to the next level and I don't have a hundred years left to do it. So I thought this would get us from point A to point C by maybe skipping over B. Yeah. And I want to be the first firm in the world. And I want to take IG there to offer every product to every customer on any strategy anywhere in the world. Including and nobody's ever done that before. Right. Yes. And yes. we're going to be able to do that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Now here's the thing. All and still, sudden, nobody's ever freaking heard of us. Yes, still, no, exactly. That's my point. Whenever I bring you guys up, they think that I'm. They think yeah, I'm like, I know. No, no, I'm, okay. I'm on Robin Hood. I'm like, okay, really? Yeah, show, yeah I'm show, past so, all that. Show, I'm past so, all that shit. Show me I'm how to short that. a put on Robin Hood. Give me, show me that yes, one real quick. Right. Uh, so now, now you are all of a sudden, you and your uh, co-founders of Tastyworks are in possession of six hundred million dollars worth of shares of IG. Are you now an executive or a board member at IG Group? Board member, no. I'm the largest shareholder. Okay, you're the largest shareholder at IG Group. So they, <laughs> okay, got it. All right, so now you have that. And now can we, let's, we make it back into the financing here a little bit. But what is it that makes this whole thing so profitable. So t Tasty Works the, or Tasty Trade, the reason why it works so much is because, and by the way, I, I teach a, a mentoring program now, and a lot of the stuff I do comes from what I learned from you, which is every 15 minutes, I need something actionable. Yeah, I need a takeaway. That I need cool. a takeaway every 15 minutes. So my modules are 15 minutes long, and every one of them has a takeaway because of what's called the Men of Action Group. We have to take action every single time we do something. So now, in your situation, uh, you're doing these 15 minute segments. The 15 minute segments teach us things like strangles, straddles, all these different. Uh, uh, ways of looking at it and how we can change the probability. The markets are the markets are even efficient market hypothesis. Uh, so here's the thing I want, I want to ask you about this, right? The first off the tasty trade methodology, when we get into things like ball contraction, uh, uh, standard deviation, all that kind of stuff. Can you describe, and by the way, you can go as detailed as we can talk about Fisher Black if you want. Go as detailed as you want. My audience is pretty smart and talk about uh, the tasty trade methodology. Why is it that this works as opposed to like trying to pick stock direction? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, like, we don't give people a theoretical advantage. Yeah. What we yeah. give, what we try to do is engage people to a level where, um, uh, where they get to challenge themselves with potentially a mechanical advantage. And, you know, like, there are certain places, you're in Las Vegas, there's, there's no way to have a mechanical edge. There's a negative edge built into Vegas. Yeah. You know, unless there's you're the a house. negative edge. Unless yeah. you unless you are the house, yeah. Well, of course, but you assume you're not the house, right? Because and assume as a retail investor, you're not the house. But the difference between you know Vegas and and free and efficient markets is you can take either side of the trade. And if the market's a penny wide, it doesn't matter. You know, we're talking. It's it, there's no edge to either to either party. It's basically you know the only thing out there to me is a mechanical edge. So what we like to do is to create. Uh, a challenging intellectual environment for investors because we we have a you know this Michael we think everybody's smart you get to a certain point where you want to learn strategic finance the assumption is you're smart okay you're you're not you don't want the crap dumbed down to you by some idiotic advisor that you're ten times smarter than you don't want some salesperson just give, feeding you bullshit you are you're at the point where like listen. I can do this. I want to learn it. I want to learn how this works. I want to understand the mechanics. That's what we do. We built a math. We essentially built a model around math to show you that probabilistically everything is efficient. Yes. And we can create an environment for everybody where the statistical chance of you being right is greater than the chance of you being wrong. Right. The difference is it doesn't mean you're going to net make money in the end. You know, like all we're saying is, hey, 
I can make Michael Sartain, I can put you in a position where you're going to be right 70% of the time. Yeah. Fact. If you create enough occurrences, you are factually going to be right 70% of the time. You cannot argue with the math. The difference is I can't say that you're going to make money being right, right 70% money, of the time. Because those 30% of the time when I'm wrong, I may lose what I made. But yes, I, that's, I, that's it's, right. it's funny because I actually prefer 30 delta options. So 30 delta option, when if I sell a 30 delta put, that means my probability of profit is around 70% plus Seventy percent plus the 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 premium I collected. So yeah, that makes sense. That that's that's. I know I don't want to get too far into it. We can if you want, but uh, I'm just kind of interested. No, no, no. We don't have to get too far. Yeah. I think I think you know that that's that's fine. We don't want to yeah. lose people. No, no. Yeah. But like for instance, for those of you who are like really interested, check out the options 101. Uh, the options 101 playlist on Tasty Trade. I think still that's my favorite one. Uh, Mike and his whiteboard, and then also uh, the what's the first the options crash course with uh, Dr. Jim Schultz. Those are three great places to start if you guys are interested in learning about uh, stock option trading. Isn't it funny though, Tom? Like uh, you always talk about them being traditional finance, and now these crypto guys to these crypto guys, your traditional finance, right? Yeah, you, it you, is interesting. But the problem, see, see, I'm I'm very mixed on 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 these crypto guys. On the one hand. I find the space, I find the digital asset space fascinating. I'm actually, I'm actually a huge believer. I'm a buyer of, you know, decentralized finance. Yeah. I think it's a game changer. It's not going away. It's not overvalued. Uh, I mean, I mean, short-term pricing may be a little too high, but but the concept of globalization through tokenization. The, the idea that we are going to have, you know, software-based currency and that we're all going to essentially live in a tokenized NFT world in the future, I'm all in. I, I, I don't see any other, I don't see that ever reversing. The difference is it's not strategic yet. Yeah, because you, you know, it's, and, and this is what those guys don't get. You have these freaking brilliant people in the world of decentralized finance you have you have one brilliant freaking freakazoid brilliant crazy software developer one after another and they don't understand that in order for this to go mainstream you're ultimately going to have to create you know a way to make this like like finance listed finance what we what we do didn't go mainstream until high frequency technology right took over to allow the markets to be tight enough for the Michael Sartains and the Tom Sosnoffs of the world to do whatever the hell we wanted to do. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that, um, with the idea of DeFi. And then you also mentioned before about Web 3.0, where the entire web would be based on some sort of blockchain verifiable, you know, uh, yeah. type, of, type, of, type of transactions for everything. Yeah, there's going to be a crypto ecosystem. And I like people that poo poo, you know, Web3 and stuff like that. But, you know, we never go backwards. Yeah. We're never going to go backwards. It's a joke. You know, like, like I give some of these crazy crypto, like e even the guys that started crypto.com and, you know, and, and FTX and, and uh, a lot of these other firms, you know, um, and Binance, I mean, Coinbase, I give them the credit. Even the guys that started Robinhood and everything, you know, you got to give them, you got to throw them the bone because, man, those are amazing outliers. Those are those are unicorns, crazy stuff. But at the same time, I'm not sure how they're, you know, I don't know if they have the vision or they understand like what it takes to get. I, I'm, they probably do, so I'm probably you know underestimating, but but the need for. Um, a derivatives marketplace to create an efficient pricing model to allow sustainability does not exist today. Yes. And yes. that has to come. So let, let's, I'm going to skip ahead because I wanted to wait later to ask this. The thing that I am most excited for, and I imagine you're pretty excited for too, would be liquid options on cryptocurrency. What sure. are the steps that would have to have to be taken? Are there regulatory steps? Is it yes. a function of, of market makers? What what are the steps that would happen that are keeping this from happening? I know Ledger X has some very like illiquid options right now. Yeah, I forget but, Ledger X. But, but but what would what would have to happen? Because by the way, I, I you know James Munchian, I keep telling him when when there's options on crypto, I want to I want to launch the first fund on this because I feel like these are the two spaces where I know the most about, and I would love to do something like that. Can you talk about options on crypto? What what what's keeping this from happening? Well, right now, what's keeping it from happening is regulatory clarity. Okay. So you know you cannot lit, right now uh, digital assets are essentially cash assets, so they're not leveraged in the U.S. 
And listen, you can say whatever you want, but the U.S. is the center of all financial activity. Yeah. It's the center of all global liquidity. And until you can list products in the U.S. and under under the heading of being a security, so you can't have a derivative on something that's not a security, right? And you can't have a derivative on a cash asset with no leverage. So until there's leverage, and until they have figure out what classification, what regulatory body they're going to fall under, there's not. So we need regulatory clarity tomorrow. Like if there was regulatory clarity, I mean, it would take Citadel less than 30 days. It would take, you know, Citadel, Simplex, Jump, whoever it is to create options on cryptocurrencies. They basically could do it essentially overnight. But, but doesn't so this, all it takes. Isn't this problematic, though, because we have the one side that wants the anonymity, right? This is the, the when you talk about people who poo poo on Web 3.0, that's the problem. Like every time I go to a porn website, there's a I'm to, my my view is now tokenized, right? That's what people don't want with Web 3.0, right? And the regulation of cryptocurrency. I, how am I going to launder money and sell crack cocaine to my friends if I if I have to, you know, I'm saying if cryptocurrency is regulated? The other side is, though, you're now what I'm here's what I'm asking Is it possible to get liquid options without using US fre, uh, uh, federal legislative agencies? Is it possible for their to be exchanges that are outside the U.S. judicial system or the U.S. regulatory system that would be able to provide liquid options. Why is that not happening? Because because there's no they're not, because these options are offered by single firms, so there's no fungibility. Got it. And okay. Okay. No, if there, you can't you can't create a competitive market. Got That's it. like me saying, you know, I want to bet on the game. But the only person willing to take the bet is you. Yeah. So Michael Sartain's making a market, you know, on the Raiders game this weekend, but nobody else can. Yeah. You know, because so so I'm stuck with your market. It's not a competitive marketplace. It's not, you know, it's not fungible. I have to come through you. I in order for the system to work, you're going to need some. So the reason that ledger the reason that Ledger X sold to the SIBO, the reason that crypto.com bought the small exchange, and the reason that FTX bought uh Urex. Or uh, not your ex. Um, uh, the, the they bought they bought a crypto exchange in Chicago, um, and the reason that that all three of those trades happen is because these crypto firms understand that they are going to need an exchange in order to actually facilitate the growth of derivatives in this space. And in order to get to the next level, they're going to have to have exchange approval and come through the regulators. Got so it. what they're Got doing. And the reason that they paid, I mean, the reason crypto.com paid us $250 million for something that, to be fair, it was not worth $250 million for Nadex and the small exchange, but they paid us $250 million because it's a three-year wait Yeah, if they go through the regulatory channels. And that's even if they get approval. This way, they can speed up the process. And what's $100 million extra to them? Right. It's okay. a lot to us. <laughs> it's a lot to you. Okay, got it. All right. So so that's essentially what would happen. And then here's another theory I have, just my hypothesis. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Some of the extreme volatility in some of these coins, especially the ones that are uh, higher higher uh, market cap, a lot of that would go away if there was liquid options. Because instead of me trying to buy Bitcoin to try to do the up to get the upside, I could sell puts or buy calls on it. And I could tell a lot of volatility might get sucked out of the initial equities or the initial coins. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that, do you think that- hundred uh, percent of efficiency, as soon as there's a deeper, more liquid market with more, with more participants. I mean, right now you have a very thin market with, with very weak market making infrastructure. When you don't have, when you have the 50 biggest players in the world, not playing, how could you possibly, right. you know, that's like saying, again, I'll go back to a sports gambling analogy. Imagine if you took Caesars, MG, I don't even know who the biggest players are, but imagine if you took the 10 or 15 biggest um, bookmakers in Las Vegas out of the out of making markets on 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 college or pro, pro games. Next thing you know, what do you have? You have a crappy little market that's right. 500 up. Um, it's, it's the same thing. You don't have any of the large firms right now making markets, as soon as all those firms come in, you're going to add a trillion dollars in leverage to that space instantaneously. And all of a sudden you get their technology, which is all crazy fast, high frequency. It's so much better than the technology currently being used by these crypto firms. I mean, they're not even in the same league. So they're, just, they're, they're in a different world. Can you can you explain to the audience the idea? Because, you know, obviously there's Michael Lewis writing books that you don't agree with. They're talking about how high frequency, same thing with 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 Mark Cuban, saying things about high frequency that are that are factually incorrect. Well, high frequency trading actually creates, we talked about bid ask, ask spreads that you guys had in the pits that you could drive yeah. a truck through. Now the bid ask spread is much, much narrower. And the reason why is because of high frequency. Of a penny. 
it's fractions of a penny. I mean, Michael Lewis is dead wrong. It's in, it's embarrassing how bad his stuff is. The Flash Boys and everything else. I know he thinks he did a good he did a good deed, but it's not. Mark Cuban completely out to lunch on this. Smart guys, brilliant billion. You know, he's a brilliant billionaire and everything else. I don't know him or anything like that, but um, I assume from everything I read, you know, brilliant guy. Everything else, but they're completely don't understand how liquidity works and. The concept of high frequency market making allows guys like Mark Cuban to make investments and to liquidate those investments in the public marketplace because of the liquidity that's available, right. because of the derivatives marketplace, which creates all this interest for stuff that would not normally have any interest. And so it also creates tight and liquid markets that allow all these retail customers to participate at very fair prices. No commissions, penny up markets, can't ask for more than that. So, so I mean, let's talk about this because uh, I, I was going to skip ahead again. Also, let's talk about Karen Super Trader, Karen Bruton. So, just in her situation as a retail trader, for her to be able to manage three hundred million dollars as a retail trader, that doesn't happen without tight bid ask spreads because she's having to put in orders uh, in SPX for you know options for hundreds of millions of dollars. That doesn't happen unless she has the the, the ability to do that. Well, back when she was doing that, she's not doing it anymore. But back yeah. when she was doing it. I mean, she had to use a single product that could support that kind of, you know, that that amount of notional value. Yeah. So the answer is yes. So she, had, when um, you say the single product, you mean SPX? You don't mean take because yes. she was using Thinkorswim to make some of these trades, right? No, 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 no. I mean, I mean the the product itself, the SPX yeah, or SPX. the SPX or the S and P options, yes. or you could use S and P futures options. Yeah. But yeah, you have to use a product that can handle a hundred million dollars of liquidity. But the you know, I mean, on, for a long time, Bitcoin couldn't handle ten million dollars of liquidity. Now it can handle hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity. But you know, or a billion dollars of liquidity, no problem. But for a long time, for three or four years, it couldn't handle ten million dollars of liquidity. That's that's awesome. All right, so Tom, I want to I want to go over a subject here, and you can you can riff on this as much as you want. No, no one knows anything. Yes. Now here's the thing. I live in, no offense to my buddies here, the douchebag corridor of the planet, right? The LA Vegas corridor. There are <laughs> the, the Lambo index, the bro, the bros with the neck tattoos who just got out of prison and, 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 are, and are buying crypto. I, I'm surrounded by them. They're everywhere. They actually turned me off to crypto initially, the, 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 this bro culture that was here. I just didn't really want it. I was like, it didn't make any sense to me, okay? I think crypto is brilliant. I think blockchain is the future, but I just didn't like the environment that I was around here, okay? These guys are coming out. They're selling products. They say things like crypto hedge fund. I always stop them. I'm like, there's no, way, there's no such thing as a crypto hedge fund because you can't hedge crypto. You can't hedge it. You can't buy puts on it. You can't buy calls. You can't sell puts. You can't sell calls, and you can't short it. So there's no, there's no way to hedge it, so it's not a hedge fund. You can hedge it against something else, but there's no such thing as a crypto hedge fund. I've got yelled at because of that, right? But it's true. You know it's true. There is no yeah, such, yeah. There's no way to have a crypto hedge fund. Can you explain no one knows anything? Technical analysis. You, you've had several people. You would have Jared on there. You've had uh, Jim Schwartz. Technical analysis flat out, scientifically, has been proven, like, unequivocally, does not work. Can you talk about this? Well, you're going to get a lot of, you know, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of negative feedback for that. But, yeah. um, um, and there's there's a lot of believers, which is okay, because people like to believe their own stuff. It's fine. Um, it is, technical analysis is a interesting tool for engagement. I'm totally fine with that. But as a, you know, as a mathematical tool, I mean, with some mathematical significance, or some mathematical proof or validation, the answer is no. Um, we say nobody knows anything because, I just don't think that even if you had tomorrow's news today or you had tomorrow's economic numbers, or even if you knew what the market was going to do and close a month from now, I'm not even sure that that would help you make any money. Okay. You know, like I know as crazy as it sounds, but it's not, it, it's, if you, if you go back and you look at certain events and you try to take, Hey, if I knew this was happening before it happened, um, you know, could I have made some money? And the answer is probably not. So you, you've actually done studies on this, and that's why. Oh, I we've done it. a yeah. crazy number. We've so, done probably a thousand hours, two thousand hours of studies. Let, we let just me wrote a book on this. Let, let me set this up for the audience, okay? So basically, what Tom's talking about, I believe you did one on IBM several years ago, and you've done several since. We've then. done a million. All right, of them. so let's yeah. just, just use the IBM one. So basically, what it what what the study was is that you go back in time and you know before anyone else knows 
whether an IBM exceeded their earnings numbers or did not exceed their earnings numbers. If they exceeded their earnings numbers, you go long on the product. If they do not exceed their earnings numbers, you go short on the product. And when you did that, you made no money. Even though you knew the earnings numbers before anyone else, you still made no money. This is what we're talking about where nobody knows anything. That good news happens to a, a company, the stock price goes down. Makes no sense, right? What happened? We just, Jack Dorsey, he resigns over at Twitter. The stock price goes down. Then it goes back up. Nobody knows shit. That's the point that you're trying to make. What are the, and you, uh, D uh, Dylan Radigan asked you this the other day, and I'm going to ask you the same thing. What are the point of economists? What, what, what are the point of having them? What is the um, point? They're good for um, they're good for PR. They're good for quotes, um, and they're also good for um, uh, they're anti litigation. So they're they're like insurance against litigation. So if Michael Sartain is a customer just of let's say X Y Z giant financial firm like Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or or somebody else or Wells Fargo, and and your Wells Fargo advisor puts you into a certain investment. And let's say, you know, has you buy a real estate REIT or, a, you know, or some crazy overseas, whatever. And they'll say, how could you have done that? And you'll just take out the 73 page report by their economist saying, hey, he loved real estate REITs. I just did what the firm was telling me. So it's an anti litigation, <laughs> like it's anti litigation insurance. Um, as a, at, in addition to that, it's good. It's quote worthy. If the Wall Street Journal um, needs a quote. They're not calling Tom Sosna from Tasty Trade and saying, "Hey, could you give me a quote on what you think about this?" They're they're calling Joe Blow from Goldman Sachs so they can say, "Hey, Joe Blow from Goldman Sachs says this." It's funny because I have this discussion about technical analysis with people all the time, and they're like, "Yeah, but it gives me a little bit of edge," and I'm like, "It doesn't." Not even a little bit. And uh, you had Jared come on and he, he said something to the effect of it gives you so little edge that it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't hurt. Is it, it was it something to that effect? Do you remember that? It, it was like it, one of the takeaways. It, it, it's it's actually the it, there is something to be said for any kind of analysis, which is engagement in the business. And, you know, whatever gets you excited about the business, I'm cool with that. That's incredible. All right. So we did technical analysis. Like you said, there is no math behind it. There is no science behind technical analysis. Fundamental analysis. This is something that I, I, I've always said that my theory about this is when Warren Buffett is giving your, you speeches about fundamental analysis, he, there's an inequity of information at this point, right? There is no internet back in the 70s and 80s when he's making these incredible deals that he's making. And, and he's actually, he talks about this in Snowball, one of his, uh, the books that was written about him, where he's hiring private investigators to go find out certain information about these companies that he was going to buy that the public did not have access to. That doesn't exist anymore. And you'll also notice that Warren Buffett's edge does not exist anymore. I believe personally that some of the reason why fundamental analysis did work in the past and doesn't work now is because the, the the asymmetry of information is gone. Do you agree with that? I think that's absolutely 100%. Yeah, so so fundamental analysis again, this is these are the two things that we're always taught when we read the intelligent investor and people are quote, quoting, you know, Ben Graham, it's always these things and I'm like that that worked before we all again for me to get an earning sheet for anything. I literally could say, "Hey Siri, what well, actually I don't want to do this right now cuz Siri's actually going to turn on." But what's the what was the earnings for, you know, whatever for this time? Siri will pull it up immediately. The asymmetry of information is gone, so I believe that fundamental analysis. See, the reason why the, I think a lot of people get this wrong cuz I how many times I've been hit up, "Hey Michael, we've got this artificial intelligence software that's going to make money on the market." I'm just like, what, what, what about Jim Simon's artificial intelligence software? You don't think he has better artificial intelligence than you? Your alpha, he's going to take your alpha before you take it. When you have all these computers that are smarter and smarter going against each other in a complex of adaptive system like free markets, they're going to take each other out, others alpha to where back to where we started. And that's the thing people don't understand is like this, this individual feeling of like, I'm special and I know how to pick this better than anyone else. And that's just not the case. And then what makes it really frustrating, Tom, is when you have, you know, a 16 year old cousin who smokes marijuana, who bought Bitcoin at 10,000 and he made a bunch of money and he's trying to tell you about the fun that he's starting because he's so much smarter than you because he made a bunch of money when he got it up, up to 60, you know what I'm saying? Or Ripple even before that. And you're like, and the, the problem is now they think they know something. They, they, know just, okay. they know just enough to get themselves in deep, deep trouble. And that's part of the issue of what's going on. So um, can we, uh, let's go talk about something else. I teach my clients about the normal distribution. I think okay. the normal distribution, uh, for those of you guys remember Bell Curve from your statistical class, those numbers, 16, 84, 68, 
keep popping up over and over again whenever you guys do studies. Those numbers from a normal distribution, for those sure. of you who don't remember, you have your mean, which is in the middle, and then you have 34% uh, uh, plus or minus, which is plus or minus one sigma, and then outside of that, it's one standard deviation, and then outside of that, you have another 16 delta, uh, 16, 16% on each side to make up another 32%. And so one standard deviation is 68.27%, two standard de deviations is 95.5%, and three standard deviations is 99.7%. These are, these are numbers that we memorize as stock option traders because what you're going to find is that it's not just stock options that do this. It's pretty much every decision I make in life, I can find rest somewhere on this normal distribution. Have you noticed this also, Tom? First thing I tell my kids, yeah. everything, it, it, when in doubt, 16%. Exactly. <laughs> if something's hard, if, if something seems like it has a reasonable chance of happening, just say approximately 70%. 68%. And if something, if something, if somebody says to you, what do you think the chance of me being able to do this? It's a, kind of a stretch. Just say 15%. Yeah. And if you want like the, the one in a gazillion shot, just tell them three standard deviations yeah. plus you'll win the hearts of your teachers. Three, three standard deviations, three point, uh, three tenths of 1%. No, I do this all the time. I tell my friends, it's not the 80, 20 rule anymore. It's the 84, no, 16. No, no. It's the 84, 16 rule. Cause that's, if yep. you, if you actually look at it, you guys will find in normal distributions of anything, people's height, coin flips, people's, uh, economic status, income, all this kind of stuff. You're going to find that event again, like when you look at the number of people that have blue eyes in the world, it's, it, it matches up right with two standard deviations. It's really crazy when you look at all these things and how they fit perfectly with the normal distribution. So it's something that I study and I teach my clients. Whenever you're making a decision, there is a high probability move. There is a 68.27% decision to make in your matrix. Figure out which one of those things is, is that and then and then choose accordingly based on that. So yeah, I love well, it. Think, I think one of the neat ways to explain finance and, and a normal distribution curve is to explain it in terms of where people fall inside of that curve. So what I mean by that is the way I like to explain it is I say, hey, take a normal distribution curve, which which about 68, let, let's just round up and say about 70% of the people are going to fall inside of this normal distribution curve. On the plus side of average is going to be 35% of you. Yes. On the yes. on the on the on the negative side of average or the slightly below average is going to be the other 35% of you. So 70% of the people in this room, if I'm talking to 100 people, you know. 70% of you are going to be somewhere in that average range, 35 above the line, 35 below the line. 16 people in this room or 15 or 16 people in this room are going to blow the doors off. Yeah. All right. And 15 or 16 people in this room are not going to make it. Not going to do anything. You're not going to be successful at whatever you do. And like, if you start to think about those odds, because the whole world falls into that, those categories. Like if you told me when you're starting out and you're 22 or 23 years old, and I could talk to a group of 100 kids, and I could say to that room, and if I was sitting in that room, I'd feel this way. If I could say, hey, you know, because most people think that there's an unfair advantage to like one or two people in the room. But the reality is there's about 15% of you that are going to knock, you know, knock it out of the park. And there's only 15% of you that are going to totally swing and miss. Everybody else is going to fall somewhere in between. And that's a really neat way of explaining kind of a, a normal distribution because, because I think if you think you're one at 15 out of 100 slots to go to the another level, I think that that gets people excited. Yeah. And then when you try to explain to someone who understands statistics, like, well, Elon Musk is a three standard deviation move more than three standard deviations right yeah he's a he's a 10 standard deviation but yeah, whatever he's an outlier he's the yeah. fat he's the yeah he's the the fat tail outlier exactly yeah um, can, can we talk a little bit about a couple of other things that I think are fascinating probably the thing that sold me the most and when I do get people to come over to the tasty trade methodology is the idea of vol contraction can you explain that how basically I try to explain like this like vol contraction is almost like a heart rate or like fear if it, or a heart like I, I usually say heart rate I can get my heart rate up to 170 180 but eventually it has to come down even if that means I die. At some point, my heart rate cannot stay up around 200. It's the same thing with volatility. And when we talk about volatility specifically, we're talking about forward slash VX or the VIX, which is a, a product at the uh, CBOE. Is that where the VIX is? Yes. I keep forgetting. All right. Yeah. So, so basically it's a, it's a product that measures the, the implied volatility 
on the S and P 500. That volatility, like today, it's at 18. When we had a uh, when we had a little market down move a couple days ago, it got up to 21, 22. And during the Corona crash, it got all the way up to 84. I believe the high the highest print was something like 84, or 87, or something like that. That was the highest I, I'd ever something seen like it. That. Yeah, uh, highest I'd ever seen it. But it can't stay up at 80 or 60. It can't stay up at those numbers. Eventually, it comes back down. So we know when it's high, if we sell premium and premium uh, meaning selling options, those options, one of the things that goes into baked into the price of those options is the amount of volatility volatility in that marketplace for those options, we know that volatility will eventually return back to its mean. And in doing so, the price will come down. And since we shorted those options, we, when we close the position, we should make money. Can you go over the idea of vol contraction? Well, the difference between the easiest way to explain vol contraction is that it's, it's, a, it's a math equation. And most people think that all of finance and all numbers are like, you know, not necessarily mean, they, they think everything's mean reverting and because it's it's kind of like math and eventually things will normalize. The truth is that price isn't actually mean reverting. Price can go up forever. It doesn't have to go back to where it was. It doesn't, there's no there's no math equation behind price. It's It could be emotional. It could be true growth, who knows? But with volatility, it really is a math equation. And so it's not it's not a matter of if, it's a matter just of when. Yes. And yes. and the way that volatility works and the way you have to remember, volatility is fear. It's the pricing of fear. And fear is a very, is a very short-term emotion. You know, fear is not, nobody, there is no such thing as a constant state of fear into perpetuity. Right. It just doesn't happen that way because even if you were scared of something, like a pandemic is a perfect example, even a pandemic, the fear only lasted, you know, five weeks. People get used to things. And that, they, they, and, they, and that, they, ma that was measured yeah, right. mathematically because we had a spot VIX yeah. and then we had a futures and the futures was yes. below the spot VIX. We were actually pricing the fact that we would experience less fear in the future. Like you said before, a mathematical equation. I've had a physicist and evolutionary psychologist on here before. We talk about a testable model that one of the things here is like what you said before, price is not mean reverting. For those of you who are putting Bollinger Bands on your fucking charts, listen to me. Price is not mean reverting, but volatility is mean reverting. What is the best? time to sell a hurricane insurance right after a hurricane what is the best time to sell stock options right after volatility goes up right because you're less because you're getting paid more for that same amount of risk that you're taking right so we do this and we know we know that if the vix is up at 30 eventually we're going to get down to a, what's a lifetime average of like 15 or 16 or something like that today 18, today whatever yes. today today it's at 18 so we know that if we sell when volatility is high and actually use more of risk more of our money when volatility is high then when it comes back down then we're going to be able we should it in a a high, high, high percentage chance make more money on top of the fact that we're selling a 30 delta option with a 70% chance probably. The problem with selling uh, hurricane insurance is A, you can't. Right. And B, the market's too inefficient. Yes. So so it's like, you know, it's not, it's it's not an option available to you, but you can sell, you know, marketplace fear, which and you can sell it with a penny wide market. So, you know, what kind of cracks me up about this business is all the naysayers who like to say, well, you know, it's so unfair. It, the, the, this is probably the line that bothers me the most is when people say, you know, it's so unfair. And my response is, what exactly is unfair? And they go, you know, like trading options is unfair. And I go, and just, can you just, you know, elaborate on that a little bit? Why is it unfair? They go, well, because everybody that, buys an option, loses money. And then I'm like, well, then sell it. And they look at you like, like I go, you can't have a situation that's unfair if the difference between the price you can buy it for and the price you can sell it for is one, one penny. penny. Yeah. So, you, so there's, there's nothing unfair about a two-sided market. If you want to know what's unfair, what's unfair is when you can only buy the Cubs to win the World Series. Yeah. You can't sell them. You can't sell them. Okay. But, and, but when you can only buy them, that's unfair. But if I said to you, the price to buy the Cubs is a dollar and the price to sell them is 99 cents, you go, oh, that's fair. Like all of a sudden, you know, well, how do you guys make any money then? That's the whole beauty of financial efficient financial markets. That's the whole beauty of high frequency trading. If you don't think something's fair, then just do the other side. 
exactly. Let's put. We have pro- no. There's no limitation. You could do either side. It doesn't matter to us. Let's provide a little bit of context. So uh, eventually, if some of you guys are watching this video and you're like, "Oh, I'm interested in options trading," you're gonna go and you're gonna Google options trading, and 99% of the options trading things you're gonna find are platforms or strategies to teach you how to buy options. That's what they're going to do. Tom and I do not buy options to open ever. We sell options. Very few people teach you how to do this. And I think probably part of the reason why Tom is because you kind of chase them out of the market. Like nobody can compete with you because you, you have the expertise, you built a platform and you do it for free. So I don't think anybody really thinks they can make a lot of money teaching us an option selling product. And that's the reason why. So, uh, but that's the thing. Uh, it was really funny because it, it, the, the hit pieces they made on Karen Bruton, if you look at the bottom, it was like some option trading platform that was literally writing the piece about her. It was just so crazy when you see this. So again, it goes back to the same thing. Oh, yeah. You, I it, mean, listen, I, I don't even read this stuff anymore because yeah. I can't, you know, so many people try to market by in the in the world of the Internet. You know, one of the great ways to or one of the ways that a lot of really scummy, you know, scammers try to market is by just you find it who's at the top of the hill and you try to bash them. Yeah. You know, I, so I don't even read this stuff anymore. I'm, I'm getting there. You should see my comments. Uh, so now, so now, here we get to the situation where uh, ninety. So you bring up what you said before. Uh, something like ninety five percent of all stock options expire worthless. Ninety five percent. You don't know that though. They don't teach you that whenever you're out there buying stock options. I don't actually know what the real number is, but it's probably close. Something yeah, like that. So, yeah. Some, maybe ninety three percent. Some some number yeah. like that that expire worthless because people forget. It's like, well, I'm buying the option. If the if the if the uh, underlying goes up, I make money. No, no, no. You remember, you paid for that option. It has to go up uh, the strike price plus what you paid for it. When you sell an option. Is the opposite. The uh, the in order for you to lose money, it has to go through your strike price, through your strike price plus what you paid for it. So that gives you actually an added uh, a part of protection. When I saw that mathematically, that makes more sense to me, and that's the reason why you know I sell put spreads in the SPX. And it's funny because my friends always ask me, they're like, Michael, why don't you just trade? You, you I'm sure you've seen my trades on the uh, follow page. I uh, all I do is trade put. I get made, dude. Your guys hit me up. Butler, uh, uh, Mike Butler hit me up the other day, and he was like, oh, Hey, what's going on, Mister SPX guy? Because that's all I do. And the reason why is is because I found it because I'm, I'm managing seven different accounts right now, and it's and I'm also doing this podcast and two other. Jobs. But like if you I was I was always joking, if Tom and Tony did what I did, where they just sold put spreads in the SPX, it'd be like, welcome to Tasty Trade. We rolled <laughs> another put spread in SPX. See you guys next week. Like that would be the entire show, you know? Like they have to, they've got to do earnings trades in that in, in Netflix. Otherwise, I have to keep it interesting. Exactly. You, know, you, you gotta keep fun. it interesting. Exactly. Right. So anyway, that's uh, that part is fantastic. All right. So we talked about research pieces. The one of the uh, again, we like, one of the greatest things is I uh, so w- when I'm in a rush and I can't listen to all the tasty trade. By the way, I listen to you guys at double speed on your uh, podcast platform. When I when I'm on tasty trade, double speed. Yeah, I'm very impressed. I, I do, I right. It, it's funny hearing you at regular speed right now, Tom. It's like messing up my brain. So now w- when you do that, um, you you guys have option jive, market measures. I tell people when they're going to start off with Tasty Trade and they want to do the, the new stuff, I tell them to start with market measures. I tell them to start with options drive because these are research pieces. You guys do two to four research pieces every day live on the show. Is that correct? Yeah, we average three a day. Three a day. Right. And you, you'll back test stuff and these are like testable ideas or people, yeah, will, yeah, we viewers have, will send in um, questions. Yeah, we have like seven or eight full-time researchers, all PhDs and crazy smart people. We actually, we just, we just finished our first book and uh, one of our, one of our crazy smart physicists, um, Julia, uh, Julia, she just finished a book. It's called um, the unlucky investors guide to (laughs) options trading. That's awesome. And it's so damn good. It's like, it's a little heavy, it's dense. um, But Julia is a legit rocket scientist and um, she's a brilliant woman, and I think, Michael, you're going to love it. So let me ask you something. Uh, it's kind of off the topic, but I don't know if you know this. Uh, Charlie Munger had a background in physics. Uh, Jim Simon's a background in mathematics, and he mm-hmm. uh, applied mathematics, and he hires physicists to work for him. I had yep. Sir, Dr. Sergey Dida on here. He's a theoretical physicist. He's telling me he's gotten offers from Goldman to come and work there, and you have a physicist, uh, someone with a, a background in that. I also have a background in uh, astrophysics. Why is it that so many people in this idea of physics – is it because we're able to do modeling? Why is it that so many of us end up in the financial space? Um, I think it's, I think that there, I, I actually don't know. Um, I mean, this woman, we just got lucky and she was a friend of one of our other researchers who's a really smart kid. And, you know, she came in for an interview, we hit it off. And so she, you know, she took the job. Um, I I don't know, you know, like, like we're, we're fairly indifferent to smart people. 
So if somebody walks in and they're a theoretical physicist or they're a data scientist, you know, or they have, you know, a degree in just finance, you know, I, I really, I, I don't think it matters that much. Like, you know, like to me, math would be fine too, you know, like computers. I, I don't, right. I'm not picky in saying that we're looking for a physicist or something like that. I just think that um, we're definitely looking for people that, that can, that can create on their own. Like, like admittedly, I want to surround, I, I think somebody, I'm not sure who said this, but you know, you're kind of like a, you know, the way, the way you have to look at yourself intellectually is you're, you're kind of like the average of all the people you hang out with. Right. right? Yeah. And, and most of my friends are idiot traders. Most, so I most of my friends balance. are Instagram models and Playboy models. So that's my problem. Right. Well, I mean, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. But that's not going to get you to another it, level. It is so not, you got to surround yourself it, with some theoretical it, physicists. Unless I'm trying I to get a boob to, job. You're right. I need to, I need to switch it up. You're right. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to surround myself with some, with some young kids that are rocket scientists, right. you know, and, and I've done really well surrounding myself over the last, you know, 20, 30 years with really brilliant young people who um, who can think, you know, on their, who could, here's the thing. Can you make a goddamn decision? Right. And if you have the brain processing speed and you're smart and you can make a decision, that's all I want. Right. I, th I think this is the theory that I've heard is that so traditional finance people are using traditional finance tools in order to try to model uh, price movement. And of course, we can't model price movement. And like you just said yes. before, technical analysis doesn't work. By the way, yeah, there's actually, there's actual studies where they give squiggly lines of random movement to people who believe they know technical analysis. And these people are like, oh, there's a cup and saucer pattern. Oh, look here. There's the, there's the death cross. Oh, you see this right there? Here's the head and shoulder. They're literally making patterns happen out of things that are completely random, which kind of proves TA doesn't work. But the thing that I think is it is a combination of, when physicists, what do they do? They model astronomical bodies to, to say, well, we're going to predict when this eclipse happens. We're going to predict when this moon is in phase with this, when Jupiter is in this place, and when this asteroid is going to come to us. They have tr they have predictable three-dimensional models, and I think because their expertise in physics is to create a testable model, when you take that and put it into finance, it's not perfect, but I think it's better. And I think when Jim Simon sees a guy coming up with a model, it's like, okay, we're going to model out possible things for the price of oil or whatever. I think that's why I think that's why physicists end up in the financial community. I actually don't think that machine learning or AI works in finance, except on a high frequency level. What that means right. is that I don't believe that there's enough inefficiency in the market to support AI or, or machine learning. In order for machine learning to have value added, there has to be an inefficiency. Inefficiency, yeah. Right, which, which it has to capture the inefficiency. So when you talk about like, you know, an asteroid or you talk about, you know, trying to figure out something in the universe, there's enough inefficiency that there's, there's a value to machine learning. But when you talk about most other businesses, there's a value to machine learning and AI because there's plenty of inefficiency. But when you talk about, you know, a stock, like let's say Amazon, for example, it's a $3,500 stock with a legit nickel wide market. Okay. There's no inefficiency on right. a $350,000 nickel wide market. You know, in Vegas, that's a $35,000 wide market. Right. Right. And in the stock market on a $350,000 bet, it's a $35,000 worth of juice in the stock market. It's on a $350,000 bet. It's $5. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. It doesn't work. There's no inefficiencies to, to, to take out of that marketplace. So it's a different world. Yeah. There's this belief that somebody out there knows something, right? And that's why you pay for a financial advisor. And then when I came, when I came to work with you guys, that's when I was like, oh, okay, nobody knows anything. That is actually not what's going on. Your financial advisor has no more of a guess. I remember when I, uh, when I had a financial advisor, my family's uh, estate, and I remember looking at the, uh, the, the numbers and I'm like, so this is diversified, right? It's like, yeah, you see the d diversification. I'm like, so we have Apple and we have the S&P 500. I was like, that's diversified? Isn't Apple in the S&P 500? I'm a little confused, right? And, but he doesn't expect questions like that. They don't expect that. They just want every, like, they, they, it's, it's just really crazy to me. Like you the, said the before. The advantage that they have when advisors and stuff is, and it is an advantage, is that they, they've been trained to make decisions. Right. And you'd be surprised how powerful um, decision-making is in the world. And so if you can make a decision, you know, you can- um, If you can order a pizza. If you can yeah. order a pizza. 
and you can and you can do business and yeah. people will use you because you can make a decision. Yeah, I, I think that was what the reason why this transition was so simple for me, because for me, I have to make a decision on where to turn the aircraft over Iraq in order to do an air fueling. It was one of those things where I have to literally there is a button on the aircraft in the navigation suite where I would sit that I push enter and then the aircraft would turn 180 and pull right in front of, of the uh, F-15 going 600 miles an hour. And it, you have to make that decision. That's it. And I have a stopwatch in my hand. And it's really to be honest with you, Tom, it is the same part of my brain whenever I'm like, confirm and send. There you right? go. That, it's, it's, it's the same part of my brain. So making these quick decisions is actually something that helped me as a U.S. military officer and then helped me, off as a, helped me out as a trader. You are a contrarian. Let's talk about this, right? Tom, you're a contrarian. So let me, let me describe the U.S. stock market over the last 20 years. It goes up and then up and then up. There's a little bit of down, then it goes up, followed by up, then up, then up. Then there's a little down, then up, 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 followed by more up, up. And all the while, Tom is waiting for the crash, and it goes up and up and up and up and up. And Tom holds a short position. Why do you hold a short position, Tom? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And you still you make know, money. And you still make money. You hold a short position and you still can't do this yes. with stocks. Can't do this with stocks. But with stock options, you no. hold a short position and you have a short delta position so, and still make money. So because when the markets go higher, volatility contracts. Correct. So I keep a short position that is also um, that is also uh, complemented with a so we call it short delta. I keep a short delta position, which is complemented with positive theta. Positive theta is short premium in the market. So as the market goes higher, volatility contracts. So my short delta loses money. My um, my positive theta makes money. And that's the offset. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, because it's really hard for me. I gave up at some point. That's why I sell the 30 delta Puts no, points. I understand. It's very hard for everybody. I, I keep a little bit of long delta just because it just keeps trailing up, but a little bit of short side protection because they're spreads. But yeah, I, that, that's that's something the contrarian view. And also, you do have a contrarian view just in general. When people come in the room and be like, they make some statement, you go, I'll sell it. By the way, I wanted to talk about this financial lingo. I've learned so much lingo from you guys, right? It's like, I'll give this guy a 30 delta on this. It's like, oh, hey, hey, I came in here and I went on a date with that girl. Sold, right? You guys say sold whenever you don't believe something to be true. Can you talk about where some of so you might, you were you were a young kid. You were on the trading floor. You started hearing this lingo for the first time. What was that like for you? What what are some of these words that can you well, explain to some of my audience? The first couple of months I was on the trading floor, I had no idea what anybody was talking about. Yeah, like I literally didn't understand a word anybody was saying. It was a language that I I was too embarrassed to speak up because I didn't you know for 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 the first three months I didn't understand anything. It was almost like a it was a crazy language that I just I I felt I just had to shut up, listen, and try to figure it out. Over time, you kind of get used to it. And um, yeah, everything is in Delta terms. And, uh, you know, like, you know, I mean, your, your life basically boils down to, you know, what's the Delta of and, you know, and, and we put everything in Delta terms, um, which is the which is equivalent, like equivalent shares. But, you know, a 30 Delta basically means it has a 30 percent chance and an 80 Delta means it has 80 percent chance. And, and we do a lot. Of, there's a lot of crazy floor lingo. Yeah, that that's probably dying. But for a bunch of old floor traders, we still use it. I, I try to keep it alive. Uh, the, the stuff that you talk about when well, you, you were sitting next to Michael Jordan and you was like 32 points, make me a market. Can you describe <laughs> make me a market? So, again, it's anything, right? Hey, are you going to get that girl's phone number? Make me a market. What can you describe what that means? Make me a market. Well, the greatest line Jordan ever used on us is he leaned over one night when he was like, he was a rookie, I think. And he leaned over one night and he goes, and he looks at, at Jules and myself and he goes, some, sometime, I don't know when, but I'm going to make as much money as you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. And, and we just looked at each other like, oh, God, we're dead. Like we just said, we're just, we're like, we're dead. You know, like this guy has no idea. He, we thought he had no idea how good he was. He knew how good he was. Yeah, that's incredible. And there, hey, Travis, there's the TikTok clip right there. He just said it. Got All it. right, beautiful. So uh, let's talk about a couple other things. Your opinion of financial media. So this is another thing, right? You, uh, one of my favorite interviews is uh, at Dylan Radigan, who I've become close friends with. You're friends with him also. You guys do a weekly podcast together. Yeah. Is he had a drawer when he was at Bloomberg, right? True story. And whenever the commodity prices would go up, he'd open up the drawer and he'd take out a headline. It goes, commodity prices go up because of Fed yield, Fed number. Commodity prices go down because of Fed number. Something like market expectation happens because of pre presidential whatever. Can you talk about how unbelievably useless you think financial media is? I mean, again, it's an engagement tool. So I appreciate 
you know, like, I, I don't want to say like, I hate everybody. Cause I, I hate, I don't like people that are that negative. Yeah. I mean, as a business, I think it's pretty useless. Um, I think that I wish that they let the people that, that are, that, that talk to the consumers that talk to the viewers, I wish they let them trade Yeah. because if they let them trade, then they would have an idea of what, you know, really what finance is all about. But when you just talk about it all based on headlines, it's so ridiculous. You know, like it's, you're trying to be, you know, on the one hand, you want to have this, this beautiful macro view, but on the other hand, you know, you want to be this nonstop, you know, skeptic, you want to be this articulate skeptic and everything else. I mean, Dylan was different. The reason I liked Dylan and I wanted to bring him on board to Tasty is he's kind of an odd bird and Dylan is a, has a brilliant mind. I mean, he's got a, um, you know, he's got a photographic memory. He, he's, he, he can debate anything. He has the, his, when he got fired on air on CNBC, I'm sorry, on, on MSNBC at the Dylan Radigan show. And when he got fired, when he was doing his political rant, I think it's the greatest political rant in the history of cable television. I, want, I mean, it's been, I want yeah, every, everyone to it. look, everyone, everyone right now, I want you guys to hit pause, come back to this video. And I want you to watch Dylan Radigan get fired on air for what, like he went off, he went crazy on these guys. And I can't disagree with anything he said. And I became a fan of his after that, ever since and this is when he was on MSNBC on fast money, but yeah, he no, is, no, 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 no. This, MSNBC was, was his own show. Oh, show. He got fired on fast money. Oh, okay. Uh, he got fired on Fast Money too because he told the producer to f off in okay. the middle at a commercial break. And, <laughs> I didn't know that. And okay. She fired him on the spot, and they had that. That's on on air too. I that, mean, you can find the highlights of that. It's classic too. Oh, you can find. And both I of liked those her. I liked her too. I liked the producer they had there, and I liked and I liked Dylan. But um, so that was a classic. You know, that was like two bulls going at it. But but the MSNBC was when he had his own show. And he just went off on a rant, which was a brilliant freaking rant. It's just brilliant. And everybody that watches it goes, oh, my God, that's great. And, you know, I mean, he just moved on after that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the the thing I want to point out to people, because a lot of you aren't going to realize this, is that Dylan Radigan, when he came on Truth or Skepticism, told you he did exactly this many trades, zero, for those of you who are listening on Apple, <laughs> Apple Podcast, zero trades while he was giving you financial advice. And Neil Cavuto did this many trades, zero trades while he was on Fox uh, Business giving you financial advice. And who's the other guy, the the, the former? Oh, they all do. Zero. They're not allowed no, to no, trade. None of them do any. Again, on Tasty Trade, all of you, not only are they trading, they're trading live on the air. There have been days yeah. where I do two interviews. I go to, I fly out to Chicago every summer and I would go do interviews with Tasty Trade and I would go in the morning. I would trade. I'd get on, we'd do the show. I'd do the show with you guys. Then afterwards we'd trade all through lunch. Then I'd come back at the end and I'd do the closing, um, what, uh, the closing thing. I forgot what the name of the show is at the very end. Uh, closing we, bell. Yeah. yeah. Cl closing bell or whatever. I do that with you guys. We'd talk about all the trades we made for the whole day. And they're literally like you went, you, when you talk to Tom or when you see Tom, he's literally opening and closing trades. You will hear the ding while he's answering questions live on the air again action we take action. i make i made i made you know 75 trades today it was a quiet day and i was busy with other things but i make about between you know 75 and 100 trades a day still i've I, been doing that for 40 years i was doing uh, the most i think i did was 56 i've done 56 in a day a few times maybe in the get back 50s. out there yeah Sartain, right i know man i know i'm just what doing not? these spx spreads bro it's just my life is easier i just found one woman and i just i just go home to her every night uh <laughs> yeah so that's that's the thing so yeah i mean it, it is pretty I'm, i've i've done several thousand trades since 2013 when i started with you guys and the the experience that you get that 10,000 hour rule of expertise like for me trading there's no uh, like I would not have made it through the crash, the, the Corona crash, had I not had, you know, before that already seven years of experience, right, uh, of how to how to get out of that, how to go to the other side, how to, you know, look at probabilities. And so that helped having years and years of experience behind that. You get that more. Again, you get better at basketball by playing against NBA players, not against playing at the pickup league. You get better at yeah. trading by trading actual money, even if it's smaller. And the more trades you do, the better you get at it. Um, I want to ask you about three gentlemen, uh, and then we, we'll get into Fang stocks. Uh, I, I want to ask you about uh, Jack Dorsey. I want to ask you about Elon Musk. I want to ask you about Mark Zuckerberg. I want you to uh, – we have individuals now, 
that can tweet. We can even talk about President Trump. We have individuals now who can tweet, and now this tweet is doing, remember the insider trading problems we had before, now this guy can talk his book, but he can talk his book to millions of people, and when he does that, uh, it can affect the stock price of whatever stock it is. When it goes up, it's not a problem. When it goes down, all of a sudden, we're, there's an SEC of investigation. Can you talk about the, how the world has changed now with people this famous, this big, this rich, uh, and, and some of the things that they're able to do? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things have changed, you know, um, a, a lot of stuff has changed with respect to, you know, how how the regulators want to rule. And it 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 may have started in the political world with respect to Twitter and social media. And it's definitely, you know, I don't get why the richest person in the world needs to um, needs to be a self promoter on top of that. Like, I don't quite understand that. Um, you know, those are, those are tough, you know, like to get inside the mind of Elon Musk, you know, on the one hand, you know, I drive a Tesla. It's the best car I've ever owned. Um, I totally respect the guy's genius and his balls because, you know, he loaded up, he basically bet it all on himself. Yeah. And I love that part of him. There's certain things I absolutely hate that he does, you know, like, and so, so like I'm I'm so torn. You would never smoke weed on Joe Rogan. You would never do that, Tom. We're gonna get you on Joe Rogan at some point, Tom. It's gonna no. Happen. I listen. I don't know Joe Rogan, but he's a douchebag. And I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't know if he's your friend or whatever. And <laughs> my problem with Joe Rogan is, you know, he's one of these. I can't even listen to his podcast. Like I was a fan of his a hundred years ago when he did some show about when he used to eat that crazy stuff. But Fear my factor. problem with I forgot what that show was called. Fear Factor. Fear Factor. Fear Factor. I thought he was great on Fear Factor. Oh my God. I don't know what happened to him though. You know, the whole the whole right wing anti-vax thing, you know, it just it kind of grosses here, me here, out. Here's the thing, Tom. Uh the la the people on the right are angry at him too. Like he has, he has very, very, I don't know why he, because he has extremely progressive views when it comes to like global warming and things like that. And he, he, the thing is he's a moderate, both sides hate him. It's just each side thinks that all they only pay attention. I, I don't attention. think he's, I don't, I don't put him in the moderate camp. I don't think you can, you know, you can say certain things like, I mean, who doesn't, who's not, who, who's not opposed to global warming. I mean, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, like I, I, I can't even understand the argument there. Right. But, um, but there's other things that are just you know really important, and um, I, I, there's certain things I just don't think he gets. Right. And I don't think there's certain things I don't think Elon Musk gets too. Right. And he kind of pisses me off too. There's a there's a lot of things, and I'm not like some crazy. You know. Yeah. I mean, so I'm um what they would classify as a left wing liberal or whatever. Who gives a shit? I've been there. You know, my 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 dad was a civil rights attorney. You know, I mean, I come from a family of of very progressive anti war blah blah blah. But I'm a hardcore capitalist. I mean, I'm I'm a die hard you know free market financial guy. You know, it's not, I'm not, I'm not on, on some other side. It's just, I don't get people, you know, like, like I, I want the world to be a better place. I hate divisiveness and I hate idiots. And sometimes I think Joe Rogan's just a freaking idiot. All right, there we go. We got it out there in the open. Uh, can I talk about this real quick? So with Zuckerberg, um, the idea that them changing this thing over to a metaverse, have you, do you have any feelings about this? The idea of, uh, I think it's a riskless trade for Zuckerberg. Okay. I'm not a Mark Zuckerberg apologist and I'm not a huge Mark Zuckerberg fan. I am Mark Zuckerberg is another one of these crazy outliers. I mean, it's impossible to deny what that guy has done and the success that he's had. And we can all sit here and bitch and moan about, you know, our privacy and everything else. But I mean, you have to just take a step back and go, holy crap, what did this guy build? And, you know, and how crazy successful. I mean, again, I think he's a weird dude for a lot of other reasons, like his heart's probably in the right place, but he's just, he's just a strange bird. Now a lot of a lot of you know software geniuses and software engineers are. Um, I think he's got probably you know. I mean, I, I think the metaverse, the whole thing was was easy for him. I think it was easy because he had no risk. 
So we're, we're using blockchain tech, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, uh, again, for the stripper, I just got off work at the Rhino. They were using blockchain chain technology, uh, and we're using it in order to buy and sell NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and we're also, some of that NFT or that non-fungibility goes into virtual land. Virtual land in places like the Sandbox, where you can actually buy virtual land and, the, and you can trade it. There's a bid and ask on it. You can actually put amenities on there. You can get put eventually put on haptic gloves and a VR goggles and go to your virtual land and then watch a speech or, or uh, participate in some party that you couldn't do before in virtual reality. Do you believe in this? Do you think that this is the future? Because this is going to be powered by Web 3.0 that you talked about previously. I'm, I'm not, I haven't bought into it conceptually yet. Because I don't, I'm, remember, I'm an, I'm, I'm an old, I'm, a, I'm in a different generation. Right. I was born in 1957. Okay. The metaverse is not, you know, I don't quite think like that. Right. Um, I have seen the whole avatar situation, you know, throughout the year. Like, I, yeah. like I've been through versions of this, yeah. which I haven't bought into. Um, I am a huge believer in Web three. I am a huge believer. I've invested a ton of, of our firm's capital into digital assets. It's one of the first on, on the street to buy a digital asset clearing firm, you know, which has been a really successful investment for us. Bought a company called Zero Hash, and, and it's one of the fastest growing digital asset settlement firms in the in the world. I mean, I'm I'm into this space. I hang out with a lot of young crypto geniuses because I love talking to these guys. Um, I love the NFT space. I'm investing in other businesses that are in the entertainment technology and NFT space. No question about it. Um, I don't haven't bought into the metaverse yet. I just don't know enough. Right. I think it's I think it's lack of know how, lack of knowledge on my part. Part, but I haven't I haven't gone there yet. Uh, NBA Top Shot. Uh, that is something that made sense to me very quickly. The fact that I could own one of one of Michael Jordan shot over Craig Elo. Sure. That's something I think you would even bid on, right? The idea that that, that now yeah. belongs to you. That makes sense to you. NFTs make sense to you. Uh, they do. I had a, um, so of all the years I knew Michael, okay, I never asked for one signed thing ever. Not None of us did. We had a rule. Nobody, you can take a picture, but when he became huge, he was bigger than life. We're like, here's the deal. To get in this game, you can't ask. There's no autographs. There's no bullshit. The reason we've been doing this for 15, 16 years is because we're cool. We're just going to smoke cigars, drink beer, and gamble our balls off for the night. Okay, that's it. But when my daughter was born, I got him to sign a pair of Nike, like um, Nike, the, the uh, Air Jordans. Yeah, the little ones. The kids. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, it was the first pair that ever came out. I put it in her closet, you know, and I said, I'm going to save this, you know, and, and I think it was 1989 and about 10 years later, we go to get the Air Jordans and they're gone. Like somebody stole them from the house. Oh no. Oh, wow. So anyway, that's the only reason I like the NFT. Yeah. Right. Cause it's with you. Exactly. It's in your wallets with you, with you forever. Um, yeah. Now the, let's back to Facebook. You mentioned this before, <laughs> and vanetta has been on there, uh, Vanetta Logan, who she has yes. a pol political story. She brings up a lot of the news stuff uh, uh, at Tasting yes. Trade. Uh, the idea of Facebook as a public utility. Now, from my standpoint, it's a little different. Or as social media in general is a public utility. Yeah. In my standpoint, I've had my social media accounts. I make my living off of it. And I've had my yeah. social media accounts suspended for nonsense. I w I've had my social media accounts suspended for impersonating myself before, Tom. And again, my account is just suspended. Uh, this this is m part of my way of living. You guys don't like. I I'm telling you, you guys will feel it someday if they ever suspend your YouTube because you guys took use. You know, you said something that they didn't like, and then all of a sudden you realize, wait, this is our business, and you're just going to suspend us without even giving us due process. If it's a public utility, now they have to give you due process because now you're protected under the U.S. Constitution. No, but the other side of it is now you you want it to be a public utility because now they're also liable for what happens in those hateful Facebook groups, yes. the MRA groups, the group about, you know, let's go invade the Capitol, stuff like that. You are now, now they're liable for that. What do you think about the idea of some of these mega social media platforms as a social, as a uh, public utility? Well, I, I think given the size that, you know, in some cases, you know, the size of Apple is going to be bigger than the GDP of some continent, the size of, you know, Facebook, when you combine it with Google and everything else. I mean, you're talking about things that are the size, I mean, there, there is, combined together, they're the size of the GDP of Russia and China. I mean, you know, so yeah, 
I mean, that they have to, there's, there's a certain, you know, moral and ethical responsibility and there's no question about it. I mean, they have to do things like, you know, they've got to suspend the idiots. Now, sometimes the Michael Sartains are going to get caught up for whatever reason. And I don't even under, I don't know anything about it or what the reason is. And every once in a while there is going to be collateral damage and it's not going to be fair, but we also, at the other side of it, Michael, we cannot let certain people that run the risk of destroying our democracy and everything that we stand for. Okay. And I mean, listen, we learned a couple of things over the last, you know, four, five, six years. We learned that our democracy is a lot more fragile than we ever thought it was. It's frail. And, and we also learned there's a lot of freaking stupid people out there. And as much as we, you know, cater to a really smart group of of people that want to be intellectually challenged by finance, there's a lot of freaking idiots out there right? that will believe. And now you can see, you know, why certain dictators all around, you know, throughout history were able to do what they were able to do. People are gullible. So you do think uh, we, we can talk about the FANG stocks like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. I throw Tesla in there, Microsoft as well. The fact that we've seen this huge growth uh, in the S and P 500 in the U S stock market right today, we're at 4,700, um, 4,770, something like that. And, and the majority of that growth has come from very few stocks. Uh, and so it's a concentration of wealth that you think is dangerous because the unwind will eventually happen. I think any concentration of wealth, given the size of this is dangerous. It doesn't just have to be this, but anytime you get a concentration of anything in any business, Listen, we have mega, mono, mega tech monopolies now, which I don't necessarily think they should be broken up. I just think that people should recognize the risk. You know, when you have five companies that are worth over $10 trillion, and when you have seven money managers that are managing $30 trillion, you have to worry about that concentration of wealth. You know, and, and I'm not exactly sure what the answer is, but yeah, it, could, it should concern everybody. That the, there's so much concentration of wealth in just these few places. Yeah, that's that is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not like I don't think somebody's going to pull the plug and say, you know, blah blah blah. But if there's a liquidity event, whatever that liquidity event is, there is there is infinitely more risk in 2022 towards some form of a liquidity event than there ever was prior to this, and it's only based on those numbers. I mean, you know, there's no buyers below. Everybody's in the flight to quality. Oh, is there's Apple. nothing left. There's no. There's no pa dry powder. We're all in. The flight to quality is Apple, right? Okay. Everything is. You know, yeah. the flight to quality is Amazon. There, there's, there is no. You're not buying bonds here. For, for you know, it's, it's, it's a different world. Um, for, for my non-financial audience, what, what do you mean by a liquidity event? You mean a big sell-off? Whatever that means. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Uh, March of 2020, COVID, the, the first time we've ever experienced a biological pandemic was was a liquidity event, right? right. I mean, you know, nobody knew we market sold off 30% in, in four or five weeks. You know, I mean, that was the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was not a fun time. I'm telling you right now, that was not well, a fun Well, if you time. don't think that's a fun time, you know, in the future, we're going to see we're probably going to see a hundred percent volatility and we're going to see it in two and a half weeks. So you, 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 let's talk about that. Cause I brought this up before there's guys who are traders who are younger than me who have just seen up and up. Now my father was a financial planner. So I remember the crash of 87. I remember my dad, the dad, look at my dad's face when he came home. Uh, and I, I traded, uh, I, I did not trade through the, the Oh one crash or Oh three. I did trade through Oh eight. And then I traded through what happened in 2020. So I've seen some big down moves, but I do know young people, much younger than me, thirties and their twenties. And they legitimately believe everything just goes up forever. They say that they don't, but they do. Uh, it, like what, what do you think happens in these situations where they're fully levered? Uh, they're fully invested. The powder is not dry. We're at, you know, market all time high, a bubble. And then all of a sudden the crash happens. I had a friend of mine who literally started a, a actually he was one of my clients. He, when he, when he came to me, he's like, yeah, I've, I've started a crypto fund. And like, you started it with Bitcoin at sixty thousand. You're starting it here. This is where you're starting your crypto fund. And he's like, yeah. And then he and then he comes to me a couple of weeks later and he's like, yeah, our investors all went out when crypto dropped down below forty or below thirty. He's like, all our investors dropped out. And I was like, yeah, you should have taken some of your profits. You know, that's the that's the thing that I've learned from you is to take some of the profits. You can't, you know, uh, it, 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 closing your rolling early or closing your position early is never going to hurt you. Uh, can you talk about like what what do you think is going to happen with a lot of these millennials? I'm saying millennials. I mean, just people that are younger, less experienced traders who've never seen a bear market, actually never seen a real bear market. 
real bad markets are are really ugly. Um, you know, I traded through the crash of 87, the mini crash of 89, the meltdown in 2000 to 2003, 2008, 2009, 2020. They're all freaking brutal. Like the crash of 1987, you know, we were in the pits. I was in the pit the whole day. Um, you know, I mean, everybody, half the people around me lost everything they had, never saw them again. Um, in, in uh, you know, 2008, you know, we owned a public company that was dark. Um, we were worried about our clearing firm and other things like that. In in 2020, you know, I mean, I barely, I didn't even have a big position on and I got annihilated just on that down move, just on being short premium. I was short Delta, couldn't yeah, keep up. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, I think that it's something that's, that it doesn't keep me awake at night, but it's something that I think about. Oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, for you, I don't think it's like, listen, I sell spreads. I know exactly. I have defined exactly how much money I will lose. I know. Yeah, exactly, right. Right. I, if the, right now the, I'll give you an example. Uh, VIX is at 18. I'm using about 20% of my account. The VIX gets up to like 25, six, uh, you know, up to 26% somewhere or something like that. I might use 30% of my account, but I'm not going to go right. above 30. That's a decision I've made. I have made a decision that in order for me to get my returns, sometimes I'll make 25% a year. Sometimes I make 40% a year in order for me to get those returns. I need to make a, I need to take some risk. And that risk is I could lose 25% of my account if we have another corona crash that could happen unless i roll all my positions forward because the crash from bottom to top was about 81 days so i know that right i i've made that decision right i know that if i throw this i know yeah. if i throw this overhand right that i'm leaving myself open to get hit in the face i know that i've made that decision beforehand i, I tell my friends all the time whenever they're about to get married the time the, the time for risk mitigation is that order entry right the time the time to mitigate the risk is when you uh, when you enter the order so it's one of these situations where i made the decision you made the decision but i know we know a lot of people out there that are already panicking you see this volatility that happens in crypto markets people like quick sell and i i personally think that they're not equipped to handle what may come i had a sports better on here uh last week and he he's he talks about an impending crash that he sees coming this guy's in, into nfts and he's really into crypto and you've mentioned it too you keep waiting for this down move to happen because it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up what what kind of what kind of repercussions do you see uh, from something happening like that like a severe event that stays down because what happened with the chrono crash it came back up very quickly yeah i i don't know i don't think about things like that so like, you know, I'm, I'm a little nervous that we haven't had a, that we're at record highs and we just keep blowing the doors yes. off. So I'm, I'm nervous about that. I would prefer a two-sided market that stair steps higher yeah. in a perfect world. So, you know, but I never get perfect worlds. I'm scared because nowadays people are much more extreme and, you know, I'm scared about because the concentration of you know, wealth at the top, I think it's going to have a, I think stocks like Tesla are going to have a really hard time. Stocks like Microsoft, stocks like Apple. I mean, these things are fully priced. Yeah. Um, I, you know, Apple's about to be a $3 trillion company. I mean, where's it going to go? 5 trillion. Right. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. So, so I, yeah, I mean, that part of it I'm scared about, but are there great companies out there that are trading cheap right now? Yeah, there are. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's talk about this, the, uh, meme stocks, the whole meme stock thing happened. And this is like a, a big point of contention for a lot of people. So just to reiterate, there were certain companies that saw GameStop, they saw GameStop's business model as being antiquated. So they started certain financial firms started shorting GameStop stock, meaning that they, for those of you who don't understand what that means, that means they borrowed stock from a broker and then they, they borrowed it at one price and expected to pay it back at a lower price. These, these people in these certain Reddit groups came together and they decided, let's go ahead and buy the stock. Let's go get rid of the inventory. And what happened was called a short squeeze. And so what happened was the individual retail traders made some money and individuals, uh, 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 hedge funds lost a bunch of money, but all of a sudden different agencies or different individuals step in and stop these transactions from happening. What is your take on what happened with uh, the meme stocks and with, uh, with uh, GME? Well, I have looked at this every which way, and I think it was a transformational moment in the history of finance, incredibly important and a very positive event. I'm actually looking forward to more meme stock events over the next couple of years. They won't necessarily be GameStop or AMC or things like that. And they may not even be stocks. They may be, you know, they may be other things like digital assets. But I think the whole meme stock um, event, which is like a binary event, 
was was transformational and critical to the to the next generation, the next wave of financial growth. So I look at it as a very positive takeaway. I mean, sure, there was some horror stories and things like that, but for the most part, it got a lot of people interested in finance. And my takeaway is it was hugely important. What do you think about the actions though of Robinhood and their uh, benefactors? What do you think about? I think that Robinhood, um, Robinhood benefited greatly in the sense, and, and Robinhood was the vehicle that most people used to take advantage of what they thought was this meme stock explosion. But unfortunately for Robinhood, they weren't up to the moment. You know, the sad thing about Robinhood is they got, they got absolutely screwed by the regulators. You know, the regulators made some huge mistakes. I, I personally blame Robinhood's problems on the fact that they weren't sophisticated enough to be to live up to the moment to stand up to the regulators because this was a regular the meme stock debacles whatever there were it was a regulatory issue not a necessarily a Robinhood issue and the regulators screwed everything up um, Robinhood tried to make the best of a situation basically they they had a capital call and they didn't know what to do yeah so they panicked and they raised the capital and ultimately you know I mean look at Robinhood now the stock's cut in half you know it's a seventeen dollar stock. Um, so they've lost half their value. And, you know, un it's unfortunate um, because, because they had a big part in changing the landscape yeah. of the financial, the whole financial arena. But, um, you know, they couldn't live up to the moment. It's they did not have enough expertise at that firm. They weren't strong enough. They didn't understand everything. Um, so you understand the narrative that some of their investors What's the company that's front running some of their uh, their positions? I can't remember. Uh, they you mean Citadel? What Cit they were talking about? Citadel. Yeah, that yeah. The, that they put pressure on Robinhood to not. Yeah, I don't believe you don't one believe word. any of that. Okay, cool. I just want to make no sure. that's complete what I bullshit made up by just a bunch of idiots on Reddit. Absolutely not true. Citadel couldn't care less. Robinhood is one of their best customers. They would never. the The idea that Citadel would do anything other than support Robinhood is the most ridiculous. I mean, Robinhood makes them a hundred to probably, what am I saying? Probably makes them a quarter of billion dollars a year, easy off their order flow. Why would you kick the golden goose? Like it's the most ridiculous thing. I listened to that. I'm like, you know, and, and Citadel is one of our largest trading partners as well. And, and I, and we were talking to those guys and, and like, listen, I'm no, I'm no Ken Griffin lover or any of that kind of stuff, but those guys, they're the best at what they do. And without them making markets, this whole our whole financial system, like if one of the exchanges goes away, nobody cares. If Citadel goes away, trouble. Right. Right. Okay. Well, well they are the deepest pool of liquidity in yeah. the world. The idiots that were yakking about that on Reddit and everything else, they are completely clueless. Can you can you describe for the audience, uh, a layperson's audience here, what a liquidity provider is? This is something I certainly didn't know about when I was just trading stocks, and I didn't understand until I started so following you. When you when you make a trade, whether it's stocks or options, stocks or options, it doesn't matter. You route an order from a platform like Tastyworks. Like you know, you, you log on, you route an order. That order, you know, years ago used to go to an exchange. And the exchange would basically rip you off. <laughs> that's the easiest way to say it. You either sell the bid or you buy the offer and that's it. Well, a lot's happened in the last 20 years. And now there is this place in cyberspace, let's call it, where a bunch of market making firms that are all exchange members, they meet that order before it gets to the exchange floor. They have a competitive marketplace for that order, for every single order. It all takes place within two or three milliseconds. There's a competitive marketplace for that order in cyberspace. That order gets matched up. Whoever makes the best market gets the biggest percentage of that order. It's better than the exchange markets. And then it goes down to the exchange to get filled. So the exchange still gets their execution, but the order actually gets filled in cyberspace with another firm. So nobody's orders actually get filled. Like, like if you're making a trade and I'm making a trade, we never trade together, ever. I, I tell my friends, if you have a cup of water in, in Tokyo and I have a cup of water in Los Angeles, 
Uh, I scoop, like you pour your cup of water in the ocean in Tokyo, and then I scoop a, a cup of water out of Los Angeles. That's what it's like trading. The the liquidity provider is the ocean, right? We're not trading yeah. with each other, individual retail. I'm sure maybe occasionally that happens, but for the most part, it is actually those liquidity providers. that Everything are takes place with, with a firm that just stays in between. And all they care about is scale. And that's so their happens. whole yeah. job yeah. is scale. Participate in many as many orders as you can. That's their whole thing. So if they can do a million orders a day and make, you know, and make whatever, half a cent, a quarter of a cent per order, that's their whole, that's their whole existence. In the process of doing that, they provide all this liquidity to the marketplace, which makes markets so efficient and it makes everything work. Beautiful. Now I'm about to talk about something that's going to make your face red. Ready, Tom? Everybody oh, ready? God. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Going back to work, Tom. Going back to work. I've been working from home for the last year and a half. And you have been very, very vocal about this idea that you want everyone to go back. Now, there's a new Omicron variant of coronavirus that's spreading all over the place. Do you think, do you, do you, I know you have said in order for people to be creative, not just follow instructions, that they need to be in a workplace, a common in real life workplace. D can you describe your opinion on this? Because I know it's very contrary to what a lot of people believe. So, again, I, I'm one of these people that believe there's, I'm not a culture, like I'm not a huge workplace culture person or any of that kind of stuff, but I like to build businesses where, where everybody, where they're flat and everybody challenges everybody all the time to build a better firm. Right. And it's not possible to do that over zoom. And, and so I miss the bullshit. I miss the, the the sarcasm the snarkiness the joking the locker room i miss the ideas floating around all that idea generation all that stuff i miss it all you know what every business is boring now because it's just one dumbass zoom call to the next and we've lost our edge and not just us but everybody yeah there's no edginess anymore there's no snarkiness there's no sarcasm there's no you know there's no um uh there's no fun and and there's very little innovative creation creating and things like that um it's hard to do that from home it's hard to do that from you know um from it, it, it's just it's hard to do without people around right and i am very open and liberal in the sense of just you know when people like they can say anything to me. I don't give a crap. Anything. That's true. And That's true. I see. I see Matt just, going at you at lunch sometimes. Yes. I've it seen. doesn't exist anymore. Right. It's scary. And so it's not like I want to put people in harm's way. I mean, I'm a. I want people. I'm going to require everybody be triple vaccinated. Okay. Like you're not coming back to work from us if you're not triple vaccinated. You're not coming back to work for for us if you don't take a rapid test. You know, the first time you walk in the door, or anything like that, and you know, and you'd have proof of everything. You know, we're not. I'm not playing games with this. I just want, I want to be in an environment where, where there's people around. It doesn't have to be every day. I'm okay. Hybrid, but there's gotta be some right. interaction. Got it. Yeah. Cause I know you've gotten a lot of pushback on that. Um, and I can see it, you know, I, I used to work on a military base and now I, you know, I, I work from home most of the time. And so, and I know you've got like, especially from Vanetta where she's like, Hey, you know, a lot of people aren't going to go back to work. And there's a lot of companies like Google. I know uh, Tastyworks is still in the Google building where they're not coming back to work. You mentioned that before. It's going to be a while because of this variant where they're not going to come back to work. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a really interesting idea. And for me, you know, coming from a, you know, Texas high school football, basketball, U.S. military background. I miss the locker room too. I miss the the sarcasm and the snarkiness as well. But you're right. I mean, it is it is going to be an interesting. It's going to be interesting. I think we may just see two types of businesses. We may see one type of business where the creativity is in real life, and another type of business where, where it isn't. So I don't know what the answer to that is. It's it's interesting. I, I don't I don't know what the answer is to, but I worry that you know there's an entire generation like my son. You know, who's 29. And I worry that, you know, he doesn't have an office. Yeah. Like, he's like, you know, where should I go during the day? You know, like, like, like there's nobody to talk to. The, he talks to his coworkers or his friends, you know, over Zoom. They don't even talk on the phone. You know, it's like it's or Google Meets or whatever. You know, it's like um, I, I worry about that stuff. Like, you know, my I work with all my friends. We, we all yeah. work together still after 40 years, you know, like. I like seeing my friends. Yeah. I, I don't want to give up, you know, hanging out with my buddies. Yeah. That's crazy. 
Are there any other uh, impending things that you see are problematic? In inflation has become a topic recently. Do you see that as? Yeah, no, I don't see inflation. I think inflation's good. I mean, a, not not hyperinflation or crazy, but I think a little inflation is healthy. Nice. Okay. All right. I want to change it to one thing, and I've been at, waiting to ask you this for, for for almost a year. The Last Dance with Michael Jordan and uh, Scotty Pippen's book. I just finished Unguarded by Scotty Pippen. Tom, that book is not going to make you happy. I don't know if you've read it. I'm not reading it. But he goes, he goes at Michael's neck several times in that book, and I was shocked at some of the things that he said. What do you think? First off, what was your impression of The Last Dance? I felt like it was just a perfect time for something like that. Because, Tom, I'm, I'm with you, okay? Like, I know a lot more about the 90s Bulls than you probably imagine that I do. Uh, and I, I do think Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player of all time. I think LeBron is a fantastic basketball player, but he is a bigger, stronger Magic Johnson to me, who's a better defensive player. M Michael Jordan just didn't. He just didn't fail when, when the moment arose. So I, I, I'm curious, what did you think about that series, besides just enjoying it? Did you think it was important? And then also, what do you think about what's happened since then with uh, Horace Grant and Scottie Pippen? Well, I loved um, I loved uh, Last Dance because I think it was – I think it painted Michael like Michael is, you know, I don't think it made him into some lovable fuzzy character who was, you know, he's a killer, whatever. A killer. Yeah. He's Michael is a stone cold killer, you know, like, like he's a stone cold killer. I've never, there's no, there's nobody ever, there's never been anybody like him. I don't think they're with his skill level. Yeah. And I doubt there ever will. I mean, there's been stone cold killers before in sports, you know, listen, I mean, Tom Brady's a stone cold killer, yeah. right? I mean, there are stone cold killers, but Michael would step on your neck, you know, like, like he legitimately and wouldn't care. And, and he'd make um, up, he'd make up shit that you said that you didn't actually say so that he could step on your neck. Whatever. He didn't yeah. care. He yeah. didn't care if you were on his team. Yeah. You know, like, like, you know, he didn't care if you were the coach. Yeah. He didn't care. Like it didn't matter. Um, I, Scotty Pippen, you know, was always to me a pretty uninteresting person. Horace Grant I liked because he yeah. was just Horace. Scottie Pippen to me was a great basketball player, amazing basketball player, crazy skill level, one of the 50 greatest players of all time, no doubt about it. Hall of Famer, blah, 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 the whole deal. Um, but I was never a, you know, a huge Scottie Pippen fan. I mean, he was, you know, he was there. You know, he never said one word to us in like 15 years yeah he talks about that in the book scotty had his friends and michael had his and they really didn't talk that much off the court his main the main regret that he has was that when michael M michael's father passed away it wasn't one of these things they didn't have any each, other, each other's phone number uh he he tried he called the the bulls and said hey i'm trying to get a hold of michael i'd like to give my condolences about uh michael's father passing away and the the bulls were like well we're trying to get a hold of him too we can't get a hold of him and he says that's the thing he's regretted ever since he says that and the fact that michael bought him a pair of uh Bought him a set of golf clubs when they for, when he first was a rookie, and he said, "I didn't take him up on playing golf, and I, f I feel like our our relationship would have been a lot better had I done that." But at the same time, he just like on the last dance, he's like, he's like, Michael just made the show about Michael, and I was like, "Well, that's because that's what the Bulls are like. You weren't scoring thirty seven points a game, buddy. You know, like that's the difference." And I and I just felt like it's really interesting dichotomy because he's he straight up says I was just as important to the Bulls as Michael Jordan, and you heard that's you heard not, <laughs> you heard that's Charles, not true. You heard but, Charles. You know, Bush, I mean, Charles Barkley, or it was uh, not Charles Barkley. It was uh, Sha Shaquille O'Neal said, "I would hit him in his face if he ever." I would slap him in his face if he ever said that to me. I I, I I agree, <laughs> but you know, listen, Pippen is one of the greatest players of he all is. time, and and he has every right to say that. Yeah, like you know, like if I said that, it's like you know, like yeah, they, they should shoot me. But yeah. I mean, if he says that, he has a, he is one of the few people that has the right to say that, even yeah. though it's not true. It is crazy. I mean, he was a lot of people think that he was just another good player on that team when when he was he was a third in the MVP voting the year that Michael retired. He was a fantastic basketball player. And a lot of people don't realize that his father had a stroke and right afterwards or right before that, his brother was crippled. Uh, his brother was paraplegic and he had to take care of both of those those, those people in uh, Arkansas growing up. I and mean, he came up from a very, very rough upbringing. And for that, like that chip on his shoulder is the reason why he's such a tenacious defender. And he started off playing point guard. And that's the reason why he handled the ball. So much, even though he was six foot eight, it's just really interesting reading his book. Um, have you read yeah. Tim Grover's book uh, uh, about the M Michael Jordan's trainer? Have you read that book? No, I, no. I highly recommend that. He goes over the cleaner, the closer, and the cooler, and he talks about how Michael Jordan legitimately was like 
he talks about Michael Jordan and uh, what's his face, Tiger Woods, how these people are borderline psychopaths who literally will do anything and step on your neck and how like Kevin Durant is a different type of mentality than Michael Jordan. It's I, really, I think really Tiger good. Woods, I think Tiger Woods is probably the closest thing. Yeah. And, and their friendship is really interesting to talk about. too. I just finished Tiger's book. It's a, he talks about Michael Jordan quite a bit in there. Awesome, man. We covered everything. These are all these questions that I've always wanted to ask Holy you. Holy cow. That was long. I told you, man. I told you. The most thorough interview anybody's ever going to do with Tom Sosnoff. I got it right here. And guess ready. Bat, bat, the, the one I'm doing with Bat is going to be just as crazy. So, man, I, hey, thank you so much. Guys, for uh, Tom, where can everybody find you on all your different platforms? I'm just uh, – well, if you email me, I'm Tom at Tasty Trade. And our platforms are um, tastytrade.com or tastyworks.com. Beautiful. All right, guys. So, so just so you understand, and I and I had my clients do this. I was like, I want you to email the CEO of Schwab and see how long it takes before he gets back to you. You will email Tom Sosnoff, this guy who just sold his company for a billion dollars, and in 24 hours, he will write you back. And I'm telling you, like, he's the only guy I've ever seen do this. This is the reason why I'm so hands-on with my company and the reason why I have, you know, I, I found something that I'm passionate about. A lot of the, for those of you who are my clients who are watching this, a lot of it comes from Tom. It's the reason why I act the way that I do, the reason why I'm always sitting there. I'm, I, I don't use email. I use IGD most of the time but it's the same kind of thing tom where I, I i'm like every 15 minutes i need to give my clients something to take away some action this is not a theoretical i don't call it the men of action the men of theory group it's called the men of action group and and then in the in the situation with you it's like i got to do a lot of this my stuff all the fulfillment is done by me and that's uh, again where you were you're on you're on air like four or five six hours a day every single day you don't miss a single day you don't take a vacation i don't take a vacation i don't know what vacation means you know what i'm saying i'm here because i love being here so hey you live in vegas i you're, live in you're, vac you're, <laughs> every day is a vacation right every day every I mean, day is christmas i cannot wait to come back to chicago over there in the west loop and eat on, on that big that big wood table that you guys have and we can have, you know, whatever it's burrito day. I don't know whatever is. And I can hear, you know, Veneta making fun of people and, and bat going at your neck and all that stuff. I miss it. I can't wait to come back. Let me know when you guys are open so I can come back out there again. Thank you again, Tom. You guys can follow Tom on Twitter. You can follow him on Instagram. He has a new Instagram. Please check out tasty works. Again, if you guys want more information, I'm going to leave the link in the description. If you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about uh, quantitative finance, Tom, I'm interested to see what you think about my interview with, uh, with uh, Karen, because I got that coming up too. I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to see that. I can't wait. I can't wait. All right, Tom, I'll talk to you soon. And guys, I will see you all next week.